of last uh, people in the lobby being accepted. And I think with this, we are sharp at 11.05. I would like to welcome everyone joining us today for this webinar. Um, good morning to those who are joining in Canada. Good afternoon to those who are joining from Europe or elsewhere. And I uh, would like to welcome everybody to investigating business opportunities for Canadian companies in Ukraine webinar that has been launched by um, BDO and uh, Canada-Ukraine Chamber of Commerce. My name is uh, Mark Witwitzki and I'm the Vice President of uh, CUCC and it is my honor to moderate this important event today. First, I would like to start with a couple of household items. As you can see on your screen, we kindly ask people to please stay off sound and uh, try to be off camera as well, just for the bandwidth and an overall performance of the webinar. We use people, ask kindly people to please make sure to um, use the chat buttons to ask your questions. I will be moderating the chat throughout the presentation and we'll try to make sure I capture most of the questions and I'll present them after each of the presentations. And the webinar will be recorded, as it says, and uh, we would make sure to share the uh, presentation with whoever is interested uh, in, in the topics. So with this, um, if we can ask maybe if there is an agenda that can be showcased, if not, I'll just start with the opening remarks from myself. The agenda is quite packed. And uh, the first presenter today will be Bogdan Galking. So I'd appreciate Bogdan to get ready within the next uh, 45 minutes after the opening remarks from myself. So with this, um, I would like to start with, I think, the narrative that is fairly mm, clear to everybody that despite the, the ongoing war and the constant uh, attacks of the aggressor, uh, Ukraine still remains strong and open for business. Um, I think the spirit of the entrepreneurship and the innovation in Ukraine has been unwavering from what we've seen for the last two years. Uh, we are demonstrating remarkable resilience that continues to inspire all of us across the board. And, it and according to the International Monetary Fund, Ukraine's GDP is expected, despite everything, still to grow by 3.2% in 2024, which highlights the potential for economic recovery, growth, and making Ukraine a promising destination for the investments and business ventures. Another data speaks from the World Bank that uh, at the end of the construction in Ukraine, the total bill currently states over $500 billion, and it keeps rising. Every rocket that hits this Ukrainian soil puts that bill up. And this figures underscores, of course, the immense opportunities for building and modernizing in the various sectors. The purpose for today is we would like Canadian companies, and we know that Canadian companies, they possess a unique expertise and experience that can significantly contribute to the recovery and reconstruction of Ukraine. And today's agenda is really packed with insightful presentations from our speakers who will provide very valuable um, information on the current economic climate in Ukraine, Canada's initiatives to strengthen partnerships, uh, including our um, cooperation with multiple different stakeholders, the modernization of the KUFTA agreement, Canada-Ukraine free trade agreement, and much more. We will also hear about the real-time business experiences and practical advice on navigating a Ukrainian market, which is available in current state. Thank you for joining us today, and we're confident that this webinar will equip you with the right knowledge tools needed to explore and invest the promising opportunities that Ukraine can offer. Our first presenter today um, will be uh, our first presenter today um, will be an overview of the current situation in Ukraine, including the economic impacts of the war. So please join me in welcoming Andriy Borenkov, who is the yeah. of the advisory. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, you mentioned Bogdan, so I asked Bogdan to present uh, after me, but uh, my business trip was cancelled. So I'm, I'm with you and I uh, can start the presentation. So first of all, uh, yeah, uh, so my name is Andrei Berenkov. I'm head of advisory at BDO in Ukraine. Uh, I would have several presentations during today, uh, and this is the first one. Uh, so this first part is like a general answer for the question we open uh, to hear, like, how are you? So let's let's uh, explore it in more details. Uh, and um, as you may see on uh, our first slide, uh, it's like four parts uh, of this answer. First of all, uh, number one is the front line. Uh, we will uh, discuss um, uh, intense battle actions, uh, mobilization in Ukraine and uh, air defense. 
the second part is infrastructure and uh, latest destruction of power generation. Uh, number three is economy, not that bad. And uh, I would say in our situation is quite good. And uh, four, uh, that's aid to Ukraine, uh, both military and financial non-military aid for uh, our country. Uh, so please next slide. Okay, so like first part is the front line. Uh, let me uh, tell a, a short story here. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to admit that uh, the front line at large uh, is more or less still after last uh, successful Ukrainian operation in Odin uh, 2022. So in terms of such large war, uh, front line is more or less stable uh, during the last uh, one and a half year. That doesn't mean like a stalemate or something, because uh, we usually reading something like that in uh, uh, Western newspapers, that it's probably a stalemate, that parties like exhausted and so on. Uh, it's uh, not true, uh, because uh, that just mean what our uh, previous uh, chief commander said, that uh, we really need uh, one party, and uh, I believe that uh, this party would be Ukraine, need uh, some uh, very large advance here. Uh, not mean like advancing on their position, but we need advance in technology. The good news here is uh, that uh, Russia, in many ways, uh, they... Uh, exhausted in uh, new ways uh, of uh, advancing on Ukrainian position. So what they are doing, they are just pushing hard with a lot of resources, so with a lot of losses, and they are fine with that. Uh, but results really more or less uh, the same. So they trying to push in different directions. Sometimes they, they can move in like 10 or 20 kilometers. But uh, in terms of this war, it's uh, like a very, very small advance comparing to their losses. But Ukraine does not uh, use uh, everything uh, it, it, it can. Because uh, there is like no uh, Wunderwaffe and we need to admit that. Uh, so all the advanced position, uh, they would be like uh, divided into different parts. And for Ukraine, first of all, it's air defense and it's coming really. Uh, next part is uh, new uh, uh, aircrafts. So we really need F-16. It's not only about aircraft, but new weapon. Uh, it's our own weapon we are developing, so lots of drones. Probably you heard a lot of uh, about uh, successful uh, strikes inside uh, Russian territory and uh, destroying their potential, their economy, and so on. So uh, in any in any case, like uh, next step, it, it would be some complex one. It's not about like Ukraine get F-16 and uh, they are winning. It's not. We need to combine. We need to be creative. Uh, but my message here, it's not a stalemate, despite the fact. So we need to make the other conclusion. First of all, uh, we are uh, like holding the line, despite all the odds, despite all of the push from Russian side, we are uh, like taking that. And the next part, we are uh, preparing for next complex steps, and we really have chances here. Uh, so. As I said, like three things here, active battle actions, F-16, it's uh, I uh, already commented. Uh, Kharkiv region invasion, uh, it's stabilized by the moment. Uh, you can see uh, very, very top of the map, this red red part. Uh, so they are trying uh, to, to push, uh, but uh, thanks to our militaries, uh, they were stopped. And I believe that they would try to do so. They would try to like, um, pushing negotiation topic, but definitely it's not time for negotiation at the moment. And uh, the last but not least part is mobilization in Ukraine. Uh, we we have got new legislation here, and I believe that there would be like lots of things, but we need to mobilize, I think, 150, 200 people, uh, thousand people, and uh, this is an ongoing process. We need more people, and it's always a tricky question about economy, about uh, our military forces. So, uh, but we are on this track, and we will move uh, on it. So I believe that uh, during this year, we would have uh, lots of changes, uh, if not on the exact front line, uh, but rather on action, we, we would be able to perform. 
Please, next slide. Uh, okay, infrastructure. Infrastructure is a disaster, definitely. And um, Russians uh, started uh, their bombing our infrastructure, electricity uh, in 2022 and 2023. But um, before 2024, they trying to like create immediate blackout by destroy destroying uh, the whole energy system, uh, bombing like um, uh, all the uh, transmission capacities. And uh, in some way they were successful, but definitely not in a whole. So uh, thanks to all international partners and uh, Canada as well, uh, we were able to repair it uh, quickly. Now they're trying to significantly decrease overall uh, generation capacity. So they're bombing uh, our manuring uh, capacities uh, and that's a difficult uh, story. We still have our uh nuclear power plants and that's a good news they're afraid of I, I think that it's red line for them uh still but uh almost all coal and hydro generation were destroyed so at the moment uh despite the fact that it's almost uh summer we're coming through uh at least uh, it's not like blackouts it's under schedule but uh half of the day we don't have electricity even in Kiev. Uh, I think that's a more difficult story, but uh, our country just know how to live with that. Uh, because uh, since 2022, lots of businesses they have own generation, accumulators, and so on and so on, batteries and, and other capacities. So, like uh, we uh, to just just today, we we had like five hours, I think, without electricity. But uh, shop near my house, it's completely working, just like noisy with with their generator. So it's it's a, a difficult part, but it's a very big opportunity for us to decentralize our um, generation system. We can't live uh, with uh, large uh, coal generation, for example, which can be easily targeted by Russians. So we need to consider the who rebuild uh, of our system. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, economy, as I said, it's more or less fine. You can see uh, latest uh, forecast in the table uh, from our National Bank of Ukraine. So this year, that would be more than five, probably. And uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, the, the previous year, yeah, that was more than five. 2024, that probably would be three. And um, we can't properly estimate the influence of destroyed uh, maneuvering capacities. Uh, but still, uh, we understand that we are, we are growing despite all the odds. And 2025, 2026 uh, could be even more, so like four or five percent. CPI under control; uh, it's still uh, five percent targeted. Uh, sometimes we need to, for example, uh, increase uh, some uh, uh, taxes uh, related, for example, to the fuel. I think we would come to VAT increase in Ukraine, so that's why we would have larger CPI. Uh, but but it's still uh, more or less fine. Uh, very important part uh, that's from from frontline slide uh, that despite um, uh, stabilization of frontline, uh, we definitely win the battle uh, of, of the sea. And uh, major part of Russian Black Sea uh, fleet was destroyed. And now we don't need like any approvals and can uh, export uh, almost as much as it was before the war. Uh, which is a great news and that's uh, that's a thing which keeping our economy alive alive and growing uh that's uh, banking system profitable uh it's uh well due to large uh, financial aid we have uh, at the moment significant reserve and i think that that would allow a national bank to uh manage the whole system and uh to not not to come to high inflation or high devaluation of national currency. So it's about overall stability. But we still uh, have a budget of uh, war. Uh, about half of our budget, uh, it's like spending on all the military related needs. And our budget, it's half and half. Almost everything we, we are getting from our country, it's coming to military needs. And uh, almost everything we are getting from our international partners is coming for social needs because we are not allowed to use this money for financing war. So like at the moment, just for simplicity, you can imagine that it's half and half. Uh, and uh, this last part is damages by type of property. You see that it's uh, 100 
50 plus billion of uh, destroyed property. It's definitely estimations, and we can understand that overall needs and recovery would be three to four times larger because like everything in this valuation is more or less about uh, some residual value and so on and so forth. Uh, but it's still a very huge numbers and it will create a very, very large demand for like building uh, construction, building materials uh, and everything related uh, to uh, equipment, uh, as, as, as you may see, and, um, and everything. So even in this situation, we are growing, but this part uh, creating significant business um, opportunity uh, uh, even for like foreign companies. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, for uh, the fourth and the, and the last slide about uh, about eight. Uh, definitely, uh, we can't uh, win this war alone, and we are really grateful for everyone uh, who uh, supporting our country. For uh, and definitely uh, to Canada uh, among our top uh, partners uh, and and friends here. Uh, we uh, that that was a very uh, difficult uh, part about uh, United States aid because it's the largest one and it was very important. Due to delay, uh, we lost uh, part of our territory and uh, and, and our troops. But uh, fortunately, uh, it's it's here, it's coming, and uh, that's is part of my optimism about uh, stabilization of the front line and um, our like uh, holding capacities. So now we, we've got commitment for 61 million and uh, major part for military uh, needs. Uh, significant part of that would be like invested in uh, um, capacities uh, in the United States for production of uh, new weapon and uh, ammunition. But a uh, significant part would, would come uh, with uh, like uh, uh, ready to use uh, equipment, weapon, and um, ammunition, uh, and 10 billion in in form of economic support, and uh, definitely thanks to you for uh, your financial uh, assistance program, this Ukraine facility, more than uh, 50 uh, billion uh, with like th 38 uh, direct support uh, for several years, and uh, support for business and support for uh advisory and uh, different technical assistance and so on and so forth so it's like three different pillars uh you can see that it's not only about united states and european union it's actually uh i uh i i, I, w I was ready to mention canada but canada is quite silent i mean so we understand that it's like aid is coming but it's like always silent and uh i i can't present that but i just understand that this is aid is huge and uh, the last for uh, United Kingdom, the country who is uh, always uh, crossing Putin's red line. And uh, that's probably their role. And we are grateful for that. So lots of different um, uh, long range missiles and uh, ammunition and so on. So as I said, just to finish, uh, we are keeping, we are holding. Uh, we really can't win uh, alone, but uh, we are not alone. And we are really grateful for all the helps, uh, all military, non-military, uh, and uh, we still have good chances, but it probably won't be fast. And uh, to any help, any ideas, we are always open uh, for that and would be happy to invite you to invest, to come, to see. So just, just wait for you. Thank you, colleagues. Just the first part and we'll uh, meet uh, you again in, in uh, in, in an hour or so. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Andri. Uh, very insightful and very comprehensive overview. It's uh, definitely clear that, you know, despite of all of the challenges, there is a significant opportunities. And you're right. Uh, for everybody who's wishing to stay um, and, and listen to Andre again, he will be wrapping up our conversation at the end of uh, the webinar. So please stay tuned. And a quick reminder for those who are interested in any questions, please use the chat. We did have one interaction here that related to some inability to see the slides, but it seems like it's um, only one user issue. So we kindly ask people if they don't see the slides or have no audio, reconnect to the system back again to the webinar and you should be able to see it. Um, going forward with the agenda, next we have uh, Zenon Potichny, who is the president of the Canada-Ukraine Chamber of Commerce, and um, we will discuss the CUCC's initiatives and projects designed to help Canadian businesses participate 
in Ukrainian reconstructions. Zanon, the floor is yours. You might be on mute, yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And for some of you, as Mark mentioned, it's already afternoon or evening. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, our partners BDO uh, for organizing this and, and our CUCC team to make it to make it happen. Uh, it's an honor to have all of you here today as we explore opportunities for Canadian businesses in, in Ukraine and discuss the ways in which we can offer our support to ensure their success. Allow me to introduce CUCC for those who might not be familiar. You probably heard uh, quite a bit about us, but just, just a little reminder. Uh, Canada Ukraine Chamber of Commerce, or as we call it in short, CUCC, uh, is a member-driven business association committed to promoting trade and investment uh, opportunities between the two countries, Canada and Ukraine for over 30 years uh, so as you can see we have been in this game for a long time cucc has been a prominent voice for canadian and ukrainian businesses in trade and investment related uh, matters our commitment to enhancing economic ties has been unwavering and today i'm honored to share with you some of the uh, uh, pivotal projects and endeavors we have undertaken and and just to I quickly comment on uh, Andri's uh, uh, note before. Uh, Canada has definitely helped a lot and is helping there. And as you hear, our Prime Minister, we are there till the end, as long as Ukraine needs us. Obviously, we cannot compare Canada to yes. Uh, the two economies are definitely much, much different uh, in size. So, so uh, for our portion compared to others, I think Canada is doing quite quite a lot and is always ready to help. Uh, just to come back again to CUCC, one of our landmark projects uh, was the Canada Ukraine Trade and Investment Support Project, uh, which was called CUTIS, a project conducted between 2016 and 2020 in support of uh, the initial CAFTA, Canada Ukraine Free Trade Agreement, in collaboration with Conference Board of Canada this initiative bolstered Ukrainian SMEs and catalyzed a remarkable 31% surge in Ukraine's export to Canada. And as you as you hear, uh, as you see, uh, actually Ukraine or Canada was spending money to support Ukrainian export to Canada. Usually it works the, the other way around. So again, Canada always has a, a moral, moral uh, uh support in there as well furthermore it, it attracted over 180 canadian investors in the in, in investment area resulting in an impressive 286 million invested in ukraine from these meetings and discussions uh, after the full-fledged illegal and barbaric invasion of ukraine by russia in recent years, uh, we as CUCC has shifted its focus towards engaging Canadian businesses in the recovery and reconstruction of Ukraine uh, efforts. The Rebuild Ukraine Business Conference organized by CUCC in 2022 and 2023 in Toronto. And I see some of the faces uh, here that have been at the conference and even spoke there, served as a platform for showcase investment projects for Ukraine, Ukraine's reconstruction and modernization across various sectors. These conferences not only foster invaluable networking opportunities, by, but also catalyzed increased Canadian involvement in Ukraine's rebuilding uh, endeavors. I am thrilled to announce that this tradition uh, will continue uh, with the upcoming Rebuild Ukraine Business Conference scheduled for Tuesday, December 3rd, uh, 2024 at the King Edward Hotel in Toronto. So we welcome you to come and join us. This year, we aim to broad broaden our perspective by inviting speakers also from US, Europe and Asia to share insights on their, of their countries' uh, <clears throat> involvement in Ukraine's reconstruction. Additionally, we will highlight investment opportunities, success stories of Canadian and US companies operating in Ukraine, and 
uh, the resilience of Ukrainian largest enterprises that fuel Ukraine's economy during the war. Moreover, in February 2024, CUCC, in collaboration with the Trade Commissioner Service at the Embassy of Canada in Ukraine, has launched UCAN Pro, an online portal connecting Canadian companies with procurement opportunities in Ukraine. UCAN Pro filters according to relevance and translates to English and uh, French opportunities available on Prozoro Ukrainian public procurement uh, platform. This initiative aims to streamline the process for Canadian companies looking to participate in Ukraine's reconstruction efforts. And we have done it because we know there are billions and billions of dollars going through the system and we have really not seen Canadian participation in that. That's why we want to help and, and get Canadian companies active. We're also actively supporting Canadian companies from small SMEs to large enterprises like Aiken and Blackberry in navigating Ukrainian market and fac facilitating connections with relevant counterparts and partners. Aside from the Rebuild Ukraine Business Conference on December 3rd, CUCC has some exciting projects and events planned for fall and winter of 2024. With support from EDC, we're currently working on the development of the Rebuild Ukraine Toolkit for Canadian businesses, which will provide comprehensive guidance in areas such as taxation, legal frameworks, risk management, market analysis, you can pro and private investment projects. This toolkit is planned to be launched in December of 2024. Furthermore, CUCC will be actively participating in the Rebuild Ukraine exhibition in Warsaw, Poland on November 13th and 14th of 2024, together with NRC, NRCAN, Trade Commissioner Service, and EDC, we will be showcasing Canadian companies which can contribute to Ukraine's reconstruction efforts uh, in, in Ukraine. We'll be recruiting Canadian companies uh, which would like to participate in the Canadian Pavilion at this exhibition. This will be a perfect opportunity to learn more about rebuild opportunities in Ukraine, as well as to meet with Ukrainian and European companies at the B2B meetings facilitated by organizers of the Pavilion. After this webinar, we'll be sending information about this event and opportunity to all uh, of the participants. If your company is interested in participating, please contact us sooner than later as available spots are limited. In closing, I would like to thank all of you for being here today and for exploring opportunities in Ukraine. Uh, together, let us continue to foster prosperity, strengthen partnerships, and build a brighter future for both Ukraine and Canada. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denon, for, for highlighting uh, um, the CUCC initiatives. Um, just looking at the chart right now, uh, there is one generic question, I guess. Uh, how do you feel the perspective of war ending? Is it really possible to continue the war of such intensity more than two and a half years? I think this is a question to probably all of us as we go through the webinar, but just two cents from my perspective is that you have to fight force with force, and it seems like that we're getting more and more commitments right now from all the partners that, that we're looking at this point, US, uh, Europe. So I think from the perspectives of finishing the war, nobody can predict that, but the only way we can do this is by not allowing uh, an escalation to become an over escalation and I think that the future is is brighter than we we hope and we think and it's all coming together um, as as the the, the group of uh, individuals who are willing to make the change not only on the battlefield but the economic front can make those changes significant so with this uh, I encourage everybody who wants to comment on that and have their own perspectives of finishing the war in the next two and a half years or whatever the time is Please provide your comments, but let's move on with the webinar and the agenda. And uh, moving forward, we have uh, Sharif Nagy, who is the Senior Trade Commissioner at the Embassy of Canada in Ukraine, who will talk about the modernization of the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement and the support available for the Canadian companies. So over to you, Sharif. Thank you very much. 
very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, where you are. I am Sharif Nagy. I am the Senior Trade Commissioner at the Embassy of Canada in Ukraine. So I am a public servant uh, for Canada and diplomat. Uh, and I will talk to you today very briefly about uh, uh, what does it mean to uh, do business in Ukraine, what we're seeing. Uh, I'm going to talk to you as well about the, the modernized uh, Canada-Ukraine free trade agreement, uh, which should be coming in effect very soon. Uh, I'll also tell you a bit about uh, what does the embassy do for you? What can the trade commission service do for you as well? How can we handhold you and help you succeed in Ukraine? And then I'm going to end with uh, on the screen, you'll see uh, my contact details, how you can reach out to me and my team. Uh, so without further ado, we'll start the presentation. If you can please uh, switch to yes, building capacity. So really quickly, why why go international? Uh, why why go to Ukraine? Uh, can I just go to the next slide, please? So of course, uh, you know, Canada is a relatively uh, small economy. Uh, the world is uh, much bigger, and going internationally, you have much larger customers to go through. But not just that, if you go to the next slide, you'll see uh, you have you have new customers when you come to Ukraine, uh, you have more revenue potentials, you have uh, a diversity of the risk uh, when you're here. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm gonna talk as well about innovation, innovative ideas. Uh, the knowledge economy here is superb. You have uh, highly educated uh, 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 labor force here, which is phenomenal. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, and you think about coming here, well, you we, we want to ask yourself, uh, are you ready to come to Ukraine? Do you have what it needs to succeed here? Uh, and we will be working with you to give you an honest view based on our experience, we being trade commission service to make sure that when you come, you're ready and you come and succeed. Uh, how do you manage the risk? How do you manage the uncertainties? Uh, do you understand what the risk is? Uh, uh, how do you enter the market? Do you export? Do you invest? Do you do a joint venture? Do you buy a company here and grow it? All this, all these options, uh, we'll lay them out for you and help you uh, so you have a good uh, market intelligence when you come in. Uh, what, what we can offer you, and I should say really quickly as well as we're talking, uh, we are public servants. We work for free to the Canadian clients of ours. Uh, essentially, uh, you pay your taxes and we work for you. We don't charge you for extra service. What we do here at the embassy uh, for you is uh, we're not we're not going to bill you for it. Uh, and our network, we have, we are in over 160 uh, cities across the world. Uh, sorry, you, you went a little bit ahead of me and met the presentation. If you can go back a couple of slides. Uh, yes. Uh, we can provide you market intelligence, we can help you with problem solving, uh, we can help you on trade missions when we organize them, we can include you in them, uh, we can do advocacy, there's so much we can do uh, uh, to help you tap to your full potential. Uh, and what I mean by this is free commercial service, we're not just in Ukraine, we're all over, like I said, 160 uh, countries, uh, cities around the world. Uh, and you can see that from back here, it's probably small for you to see, but uh, when you get the presentation downloaded, you'll see where we are around the world. Uh, if I go to the next slide, uh, I think this was mentioned already uh, in terms of problem solving. So you go to the next slide. I'm just going to try to speak quickly because a lot of what was said earlier, it will be a repetition by uh, Mrs. Denon and uh, Mr. Andre. Uh, then we look at the free trade agreements around the world, and of course, CAFTA, the Canada-Ukraine free trade agreement is one of them. Uh, but we will help you understand as well how to tap into those agreements. So what does it mean for you? Uh, for instance, some agreements include goods, others include goods and services, some have investment protections, some don't. Uh, so we want to make sure that you understand what you're getting into and can tap into the full potential of those trade agreements that the government of Canada has really put in place and continue to put in place to uh, help uh, increase trade ties between uh, between uh, countries. I just want to talk quickly about 
the opportunities and the challenges in doing business in Ukraine. So, and I know we've talked about this earlier, we'll talk more about it, but the opportunities are, you know, uh, you have a large educated labor market. It's phenomenal here. It even uh, challenged my uh, understanding when I first arrived here based on my readings, just seeing people, uh, companies, uh, knowledge, uh, really bright minds. So when you come here and you tap into that and you hire them uh, or to do partnership with them, you're in the right place. Uh, you have strong cultural and economic ties with Canada, and we can talk more about this, but uh, this is already understood. You have also the free trade agreement between Canada and Ukraine, the modernized one, and I'll get into more details about what does it mean for you. Uh, you can pro, which uh, Zan mentioned earlier, that also tap, helps you as a platform to get into the huge procurement market that is existing here. Uh, you're, you're, we're talking about a country uh, that is in accession talks to join the European Union, that is constantly trying to join the Euro-Atlantic integration. So when you come here and you look at being in Ukraine for the next 5, 10, 15 years uh, and more, we're looking at not just uh, Ukraine as your uh, as your market, but really access to the entire European Union, one of the largest and strongest Euro uh, business blocks in the world. You want to keep this in mind. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, uh, if you're in reconstruction, uh, the whole idea of rebuilding the country would uh, build back better. Uh, so much potential here for this. Lots of money being put in, in there by uh, IFIs, uh, sorry, international financial institutions, World Bank, of, and of course, bilaterally by Canada, by the US, other countries to try to rebuild the country. So lots of pool of funds to tap into. Which is challenging, but of course also opportunity if you know what if you know what you're doing, or if you you know we can help you guide you through how to tap into that uh, pool of fund. Uh, the challenges uh, they're pretty obvious. There's ongoing military conflict going on here, uh, and the military campaign is, uh, is happening kinetically. Uh, the drones, the missiles, uh, uh, the front line is somewhat static, as we mentioned earlier, but we can't tell you how this is going to be, how the next year is going to look like. Uh, there's the energy shortage as well. Uh, we've talked about uh, earlier about uh, the rotational power cuts here. So that's something to factor in when you're trying to establish uh, uh, a company here or a subsidiary or a manufacturing plant. You look, you have to weigh in the risk of that as well. Uh, there's also uh, the, the issue of temporary occupied territories here, the areas that have been occupied illegally by the Russian forces. And of course, companies in there, if you were dealing with them or, or uh, here, these are automatically sanctioned if they continue to operate from there. And this is sanctioned by Canada, but also by the U Ukrainian government. And then, of course, mobilization is a challenge here as well. So uh, it's, it's an important issue, mobilizing uh, workforce. That means that uh, lots of uh, civilians are being drafted. Uh, as in, we talk to industries here and this is a challenge for them having this uncertainty in place. Beside the war, of course, transparency and reform was an issue that uh, you can read about, we can all talk about. Uh, Ukraine has made a, you know, a leap forward compared to its past, uh, but the work is ongoing, it's not finished yet. And then if I go to the next slide, I want to talk to you about, uh, mindful of time, I want to talk to you about uh, the modernized Canada-Ukraine free trade agreements and what does it mean? So, uh, Essentially, it's, it's a really important milestone for Canada-Ukraine uh, relationship. Uh, it's an important uh, commercial uh, for commercial relations, but it's important for government, it's important for workers, consumers, for consumers, for businesses, for entrepreneurs. It affects everybody. Why? Because it's such a wide-ranging uh, agreement uh, compared to the earlier one. This is really the model that Canada will be using later on in, with other uh, countries. Uh, and it's supposed to come into effect on July 1st. Uh, so in the next uh, few weeks, though, that's when it comes into effect. Uh, it presents, like I said, opportunities for exporters. Uh, of course, the removal of uh, tariffs. There's, uh, there are new chapters that will include more uh, a bigger scope than the existing agreement that was signed in 2017. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. One of the big differences between the existing agreement and the new one that will come in effect on July 1st, uh, the scope is coming into effect on the July 1st, is this one includes services, not just goods. So initially, the agreement was just about the movement across the border of goods. 
now we're talking about the services as well. So if you're into banking, telecommunication, consulting, uh, all these were now covered in, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, this, the additional benefits you get if you were in that sector. Uh, it allows for temporary entry, uh, visa entry for uh, for businessmen and women, and because we understand that we have to be showing maximum flexibilities uh, for businessmen and women to be able to move back and forth between Canada and Ukraine. Uh, and uh, so sorry, if you go to the next slide, uh, it also uh, replaces the existing FIPA. Uh, the Foreign Investment Protection Agreement. Uh, the new modernized uh, CAFTA will have a much bigger scope, will include also investment protection for Canadian companies in Ukraine and Ukrainian companies in Canada. Uh, and last but not least, of course, uh, uh, it's the very, it's very much uh, opportunities for specific for inclusive trade. Sorry, next slide, please. So uh, it gives uh, benefits to uh, businesses, SMEs in particular, small business, uh, medium-sized businesses, uh, women entrepreneurs, uh, uh, minority groups, and definitely indigenous uh, people. Uh, there's chapter specifically for them to protect and advance their interests. Uh, so that's really the modernized CAFTA. Uh, again, we're super excited about it. Uh, and uh, with that, I will also end by just showing you this last slide about what does it mean to connect with the Trade Commissioner Service? Uh, so I can move to the next slide, please. So we're all, we're like a gateway. We work very closely with our colleagues, of course, CCC, uh, EDC, other government departments. Uh, we also work very closely with as uh, with the CUCC. They are our, essentially, for intense purposes, they are our colleagues here on the ground, and of course, back in, in Canada. So uh, working with us is not just working with Trade Service, we're working with a plethora of uh, like a network uh, with access to uh, businesses in Ukraine and Canada. And then the last slide I'll put on there is uh, my contact details, so I have my team contact details. Uh, I am, like I said, I'm a rotational foreign service uh, diplomat uh, based here in Ukraine, but I want to just point out that I have worked with a team that have long years of experience on the ground. Uh, some of them have been working here for 15 years, knowing this sector very well. Others are relatively new, three, four years, they joined our embassy, but they come from working with the World Bank, financial institutions and others. So uh, come and talk to us. Let us know how we can help you. Please don't come to us after you have a problem. Come to us beforehand so we can help you navigate through the market. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Arif, for that informative session on KUFTA and the Trade Commissioner Services. Uh, very, very, very informative. So thank you for that. We do have one question in the chat, Sharif, uh, which might be directed to you or potentially to the speaker after this. Uh, uh, and it's related to managing the risk on the war insurance mitigation for greenfield projects. So if you feel, please uh, feel free to address the question. If not, I believe we have Olha Wolfk coming up after this session, talking more about managing risk and some of the solutions of our colleagues at EDC. So I'd leave it up to you, Sheriff, if you want to comment or pass it over to your colleague at uh, EDC. Uh, I I, uh, I will leave it to Olga because uh, I think she's more knowledgeable of this. EDC does offer uh, uh, risk insurance and she can get into specifics about what they can come up to. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sharif. Uh, uh, as always, great to have you with us. Uh, so with this uh, on the question, uh, the answer will be addressed in the following after this presentation by Olga. Uh, thank you. So with this, uh, now we turn our focus to the specific business opportunities that are available in Ukraine. Um, we are pleased to welcome Vera Savchenko, who is the CEO of BDO in Ukraine, and uh, Vitaly Strukov, who is the corporate finance partner um, at BDO in Ukraine. Both uh, they will provide an in-depth presentation on the diverse opportunities for Canadian companies. Uh, Vera and Vitaly will explore some uh, key sectors for, for ready-to-go investments. Uh, we'll highlight the promising projects. We'll discuss the strategic advantages of entering the Ukrainian market. ...growth and success. With this, um, over to you, Vera and Vitaly. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, 
Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to all Canadian representatives who are here, to Canadian Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce for your support. Uh, it's really appreciated uh, in Ukraine and uh, support is still needed and will be needed for a very long time. Uh, business opportunities in Ukraine, uh, opportunities for private sector, of course it's about money. We, uh, business is money, uh, opportunities need to be uh, with high margin. Uh, and we will talk with Vitaly about this. But uh, when you thinking about entering Ukrainian market, when you thinking about uh, start uh, to work uh, with Ukraine, in Ukraine, uh, now it's really... Um, have a much more uh, broader meaning because only from private sector in Ukraine we can uh, finance our army. So your investment to Ukraine not only gives uh, growth to your business, it also uh, helps Ukraine to win the war. So uh, please uh, think about this and thank you very much to Canada for the great support uh, we are receiving. Uh, I will not tell you um, some fairy tale that business in Ukraine is very easy, that forget uh, what you see on TV, uh, everything is fine. No, it's not fine. Uh, I'm here at our office in Kiev where electricity was restored only recently. We didn't have any electricity in whole our office building for a few hours. Uh, also, a very tragic example, um, our uh, supplier for many years, publishing house which uh, with which we have been working for many years in Kharkiv uh, has been bomb bombed today with seven people dead. Uh, I uh, I know the owner of this publishing house and I I know that he will rebuild and uh, he will succeed in future. His business will remain, but uh, this is a tragedy. So that is how business working today in Ukraine. But still, nevertheless, business can be profitable, marginable in Ukraine. Ukraine is open for business and uh, Ukraine is a huge market and Ukraine is opportunity which you should not miss. Uh, so, uh, Andrei previously and uh, Zenon and Sheriff uh, said a lot of things. Uh, I, I will not repeat uh, macro fin financial numbers. Uh, uh, you, you can see that our GDP is growing. Uh, Andre uh, told about a little bit about the economy. Uh, so um, numbers are fine comparing to the situation in which we are. Uh, I want to uh, share with you a few resources which uh, our company uh, made uh, together with partners. First is um, investment opportunity map. Uh, we did it together with Ukrainian uh, Ukraine Invest, it's a um, governmental uh, investment promotion office, and with the European Business Association. Uh, this is a free resource. Any Ukrainian company can publish their project uh, here. Uh, map is interactive. You can uh, choose any um, uh, Ukrainian region, you can choose uh, any sector. Uh, there are, I think now, uh, because my map is dynamic, uh, uh, every day we add new projects, so now it's like more than 120 projects there. Um, uh, some projects are at good stage of development, some projects are very, very basic. So I would uh, recommend uh, to you to look uh, at this map as an example, uh, what projects can be found in Ukraine? Of course, our main sector is uh, agriculture. IT is a really big thing in Ukraine. So you can just uh, uh, look at this map and, uh, and and see what we have on the table. Of course, there are much more uh, business opportunities in, the, in Ukraine than uh, on this map. Uh, but this map, map is quite a good uh, uh, as example for medium enterprise. Also, I would uh, tell that uh, in a few weeks, in June, in Berlin, there will be a, a Ukraine Recovery Conference. It's the main uh, Ukraine recovery event. And this year, it will be dedicated to private sector. And our government, our Ministry of Economy, is uh, preparing uh, a big guide of uh, projects uh, which are looking investors uh, in Ukraine. So maybe in a few weeks, uh, we together with the uh, uh, Canadian uh, Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce will share to uh, all participants of this uh, webinar um, a link to this uh, new uh, book of projects which is prepared to this conference. So it will be in two weeks. Uh, 
Uh, also, I would like uh, to present our investor's guide. Um, this is a comprehensive guide uh, on uh, all questions uh, which we received uh, about how to start business in Ukraine, uh, how to invest in Ukraine, what are the main obst obstacles. We put here legislation, uh, taxation issues, uh, and so on and so on. So I would just recommend uh, to look through this guide. It's quite uh, big. It's, uh, I think, more than 70 pages, but uh, uh, you can easily navigate it. Um, as uh, Zenon uh, told previously, there will be specifically uh, tailored to Canadian business guide uh, published in December uh, 2024. We will provide uh, content to this guide. Uh, this guide, which I just uh, told you, just uh, uh, for for all uh, investors from all uh, countries. So I just uh, um, advise you to look uh, through it. Uh, our next uh, guide uh, it's uh, regarding uh, public uh, procurement. Uh, you can prove, as already mentioned, uh, where you can find uh, in, can, in uh, French or English uh, all relevant uh, calls for tenders from Ukrainian government and also big international donors. They already started to use um, uh, Prozoro in Ukraine, this is our public procurement uh, system, to publish their calls uh, for tenders. So this is a great resource and we publish uh, a guide how uh, step by step how to use this Prozora platform because it's uh, not easy to navigate uh, especially with a big uh, pr project so my advice would be to go to you can pro find relevant uh, uh, call for tender for your product, for, for your service, uh, and then use this our step-by-step -step guide uh, to register on Prozoro system to make a successful bid and then to, to, to win a uh, tender. Uh, we translated it in German and English and uh, maybe we will translate this in Fran French. Uh, so, um, uh, this is uh, all from my side. Uh, now Vitaly will uh, tell you more about uh, uh, concrete projects which we have right now. So Vitaly, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much once again, to all audience. Uh, thank you very much, Vera. Thank you, uh, Mark. Uh, it's an honor to present uh, projects uh, for all participants today. Um, I would like to say a few words about uh, uh, our practice and services at uh, BDO International in the segment of corporate finance uh, become uh, uh, number one uh, most active M&A advisor for uh, three recent years. Uh, uh, last year, uh, BDO Group uh, made more than uh, 1,700 uh, M&A transactions uh, on about $95 billion. Uh, and uh, we as BDO Ukraine also participated in this success. Uh, and uh, in, in Ukraine, uh, per number of transactions for last five years, also number one M&A advisory per number of transactions. And uh, now I would like to present you uh, two uh, particular opportunities where we have a sell side mandate as a MA advisor. Uh, however, uh, we do make services on buy side for our international clients. Uh, as we were told that uh, in this event, more than uh, 100 Canadian companies from various industries and segments participating. So we'd be glad to support any uh, in, uh, your initiatives in case you want uh, to explore any segment uh, or any target in Ukraine. We'd be glad to, to help you. So don't uh, hesitate to contact us in, in, with any of your inquiries where we can assist you on buy side. Now about uh, uh, first project, uh, United Mining and Chemical Company. Uh, this is a company specializing in uh, mining of uh, titanium uh, ore and uh, pr uh, production of uh, TO2, uh, ilm ilmenite, rutile, and zircon uh, concentrates. And uh, this is strategic materials. Uh, and um, in, uh, in the world, uh, 
currently uh, US and EU approve the programs on substitute of Chinese and Russia supplies on all strategic materials, in particular in titanium. So that is why uh, Ukraine become um, one, one of the first choices as a supplier of titanium uh, ore and, and concentrates uh, to US and EU customers. And uh, in strategic materials, uh, Ukraine uh, has a very good positions in the world. In titanium ore, uh, Ukraine in, is in top five largest uh, uh, countries uh, with largest reserves, titanium ore. And uh, uh, this company, UMCC, it's 100% uh, owned by the state. And BDO uh, works as a sell side MA advisor and we assist the state property fund of Ukraine and cabinet of ministers, the government of Ukraine on privatization and sale of this company. Before I present uh, uh, the uh, profile of, of the business, I would like to say a few words about the process that within uh, uh, coming months, uh, we expect that cabinet of ministers will approve the privatization terms, starting price, and uh, the tender, uh, the, the auction date will be announced with all the terms. And then it will be 90 days for any investor to do all uh, proper due diligences, explore this opportunity, sign uh, uh, relevant agreements with the electronic platform. And the auction will be electronic auction at Prozora platform, which uh, we are already uh, introduced to you. Uh, it will be very transparent. It's interesting that uh, at Prozora auction, uh, it's uh, an anonymous basis that uh, none of the participants uh, see each other and uh, everybody making bids. And uh, the highest bid, the winner of the, of the auction. Uh, and uh, this would be the first time in, in the history of Ukraine when the big privatization uh, would be made through such electronic auction. Really, uh, in historic, historically, it was uh, very often uh, un, um, untransparent uh, in, in terms of different tenders. And it, it was a big uh, questions from uh, international investors to participate in big privatization. Now, according to the uh, uh, leg Ukrainian legislation, uh, this will be made as transparent as possible. And uh, really the winner who will offer the best price will, will win the, the, the auction. So again, summarizing the timing, in June we expect the uh, cabinet ministers will approve the terms. Uh, starting price uh, will be an ultimate of the auction. So then July, August and September, three months uh, uh, to make uh, all uh, uh, examinations and uh, due diligences for any investor wants to participate in the auction. And it, we expect that the auction will happen at the end of September. So that is why this is an incoming opportunity, uh, uh, very attractive. We believe this is the most attractive opportunity for any international investor who wants to invest in, in mining and uh, strategic uh, materials, where uh, Ukraine and the company has uh, one of the best positions in the world. So please, uh, can we come back to the, to, to the first slide? Yes, thank you very much. So a few words about global advantages. You see on the world map that uh, uh, Ukraine and UMCC located in Europe, and uh, this is the best logistics to EU customers. Uh, delivery by railway, uh, three, five days to any EU uh, country and customers, while uh, um, major uh, miners, they are in Australia, China, India, and Africa. And uh, it takes 45 to 50 days to deliver uh, products to EU customer. Uh, as for the uh, others, uh, uh, market, uh, global market uh, players, that uh, Ukraine also supplies successfully to US, 
and also the logistics from Ukraine to US better than from Africa or Asia or Australia. So Ukraine has advantages. So UMCC is in top 10 uh, global players in terms of volume of uh, uh, mining and uh, pro uh, production volume of uh, concentrates. And it is number one in EU. Uh, in, in Europe only, uh, uh, Norway has uh, mining and, and production, but Ukraine is larger. So on the on this map, uh, and you can see uh, some uh, some market share uh, of of the company on global scale. Uh, you can see that uh, that the company uh, in on the global uh, scale uh, has uh, in Ilmenite as 2.3 percent of global market in rutile concentrate 6.2 percent and it's zircon 1.4 percent. And again, uh, uh, company is in top 10 uh, globally in terms of volume. As for reserves, uh, it, it's proved reserves. Uh, it's uh, for Elmenite uh, uh, composition, it's about uh, 4.1 million ton of uh, CO2 uh, composition, rutile, uh, 243,000 tons and Circon 127. So Elmenite is the, is the main concentrate uh, for producing titanium uh, for products, metals uh, from titanium core. And uh, as if you looked at the uh, uh, structure of the export uh, company ex exporting almost 90% of all the products, in fact, the uh, company can, ex uh, can export even 100% of all produced products. However, in Ukraine, there are a few plants which uh, uh, buy uh, the products and, and uh, process it in Ukraine. And that is why 10% lives in Ukraine. How, and it's interesting that Ukrainian producers, they have to pay higher price than export price. How, however, again, in terms of, uh, in, in, in the eyes of investor, this is a purely 100% export uh, business, which means that uh, you don't take the risk on devaluation of Grivna. Even if devaluation of Grivna, uh, the company getting even better margin because most of the cost in, 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 uh, in Grivna, labor force, uh, different materials, water, transportation, et cetera, uh, while uh, export prices are growing on uh, titanium concentrates because the consumption of titanium metal and products are growing steadily due to defense segment, due to uh, air, uh, airspace uh, segment. Uh, however, 95% of, uh, of, of uh, titanium products they used for pigment pr production, which are used in painting uh, in construction uh, segment. Okay, let's go further. Yes, on this slide, you can see the key financials and uh, operational uh, indicators. Before the war, the company reached uh, uh, in revenues about $174 million. Uh, EBDA was about $44 million, which is adjusted for FRS. Uh, and uh, the company uh, has a very healthy EBDA margin and 26, 32 uh, percent. And uh, I can say here that you, you, because the company is state owned and uh, it's very often the state owned com companies are not efficient in terms of management uh, and different uh, schemes, etc., uh, not always transparent. So that is why for any international investor, uh, there are a lot of room for improvement and to get a uh, higher margin close to 45, even 50% as uh, some of the um, uh, international players has in this business. So it means that, uh, that uh, the investor can, uh, uh, can buy this asset 
uh, and uh, make all improvements and uh, to increase uh, profitability and uh, to increase the IRR on, uh, on the investment. Here, I would like to say that uh, the starting price most probably would be about $100 million for 100%. Uh, and uh, uh, if to take this price on pre-war uh, multiples, uh, so actually uh, if, to, if you take EV to EBGA, so then the multiple would be about 2.5, maximum 3. Of course, the price at the auction can increase, but in any case, uh, it looks uh, very attractive uh, for to make investment. Just an example that uh, the Kenmara company, uh, which is uh, listed on um, uh, Irish Stock Exchange, uh, it's owned by UK uh, investors, uh, and they have deposits and mining in Africa, which is uh, quite risky. Uh, they, they invested about $1 billion, while the capacity only, all, 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 only two times more than, uh, than UMCC has. So uh, it's considered to be that the replacement cost of all infrastructure and production uh, assets and facilities, uh, it's more than $500 million. So for, 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 from our point of view, the, the starting price and the, on the opportunity to buy this company is very attractive in terms of upside, which the investor can get in, in investing in this uh, company. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, I would like to say that uh, uh, there are a lot of other deposits and reserves around this, the production uh, spots, uh, production sites of the company. And actually, investor after acquisition of this company, uh, if investor wants to, in, to, to increase uh, the reserves by two, three times, can go and buy at the market the licenses and which will give uh, 100 plus years of uh, operations uh, to use this uh, production site and infrastructure at place. So a few words about the numbers. Again, uh, the Elmenite uh, volume production and sales about uh, 300,000 uh, tons. Uh, in Rutile, it's about 40,000 tons. Tircon, about uh, 20, 25,000 tons. Uh, the licenses uh, on uh, till 2035 till 2043, it's about 15, 20 years from now. Uh, and uh, this is the longest license which you can get uh, in, in Ukraine. And uh, in, in, uh, the, according to legislation, the company one year before the end of uh, license uh, submit documentation and, and get prolongation for further 15, 20 years. Okay, let's go to next slide, please. So on this uh, on this slide, investment highlights. It's again the uh, just uh, uh, you can see the uh, business model of the company. That uh, the company has uh, good resources, uh, rich in component, uh, producing uh, concentrates with high uh, percentage of TO2 metal. Uh, it's export oriented. Uh, the company has the uh, largest uh, global consumers, for example, Chemours in the US, uh, former DuPont uh, group company. Uh, and this is one of the largest pigment producers uh, in the world. And despite the war, uh, Chemours still uh, has, is the largest consumer. And, uh, and the company is able to make shipment uh, through uh, Danube River ports barges to Constanza in Black Sea and then from Constanza to US. Currently, due to uh, grain corridor, uh, private companies ca can make delivery right from Odessa and Chernomorsk port in, in, uh, at the Black Sea which already Andre mentioned in the beginning of, uh, of the presentation. And, uh, and uh, this again, opportunity for uh, international investor to make these shipments uh, better than uh, currently company makes because it's state-owned company and the top management are not allowed to take uh, risks which private companies can take. 
So that is why the company are losing on uh, logistics and losing the margins. About hundred dollars per ton they're losing due to this uh, very long uh, uh, bad, uh, bad logistics. Uh, as for the uh, production uh, capacities and uh, and the equipment, they uh, they use the same as any international company use in Australia or in Africa. You can see on the names uh, of the machines, um, and uh, uh, and uh, I would like to to, to finalize that. Uh, for international investor, it's a big opportunity to uh, to make this company uh, two, three times bigger within three to five years. Uh, to improve the margins, to improve uh, the reserves base, etc. And this is a great opportunity uh, to make the investment. Again, overall, uh, it's uh, the China in India. Uh, owns more than 80% of all titanium ore resources in the world. So again, uh, this is a unique opportunity for any Canadian company which want to invest uh, in mining sector and strategic materials uh, to use this opportunity. Uh, of course, you can ask about the risks, uh, what risks? The good thing that uh, that uh, DFC uh, and uh, um, uh, and also uh, MIGA, which is an arm of uh, World Bank, start giving uh, war risk insurance uh, for investors in Ukraine. It covers about from 90 to 95 percent of, of total investments, almost 100 percent. And the price of this uh, insurance uh, about one one point five percent per annum. Uh, uh, good cases, uh, for example, when Cargill lost one of the uh, sunflower oil extraction plant in Donbass region, they received a hundred percent coverage uh, on their uh, all investments they made for the last ten or fifteen years. Okay, uh, so. Uh, uh, I, I get reminded that uh, we are lack of time in terms of uh, our presentation. So uh, this is about uh, again UMCC opportunity. Would be glad if any of Canadian company want to participate, please send us your inquiry. Okay, let's go further. Three minutes for a second opportunity. It's in. Uh, can we go to to wind uh, electric station, please? It's next, next opportunity. Next slides. Uh, two, three slides more. Yes, this one, please. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the second uh, opportunity uh, it's a wind electric station uh, for construction in Lviv region, uh, 12 kilometers from Poland border. Uh, and capacity uh, uh, attractive from 77 megawatts to 162 megawatts. It's considered to be uh, uh, more than a middle, medium sized uh, wind park uh, electric station, uh, even if you compare with the projects in the EU. Uh, and uh, let's go to next slide, please. Uh, first of all, a few words about why uh, renewable uh, uh, projects uh, in, in Ukraine very attractive. Uh, uh, Ukraine uh, lost almost all uh, wind power station capacities uh, due to the war. Uh, all uh, European Union program supports uh, renewable energy projects uh, also in the EU and in Ukraine. First of all, in the program Rebuild and Recovery of Ukraine, and uh, and currently it's even more more demanding because uh, Ukraine has to recover uh, generation capacities for electricity, and the wind uh, electric station considered to be one of the most efficient and, and secure. Uh, and a uh, few few uh, more elements that uh, the tariff electricity tariff in Ukraine it's about uh, 1.1 dollar per 
kilowatts, uh, while in Poland it's two, three times more. And uh, due to this project is located, uh, is 12 kilometers from Poland, it's opportunity to build a line to Poland. It, it's already in, in uh, uh, working in progress, uh, the uh, com communication with uh, Poland consumers and partners uh, to make this uh, export uh, feasible. Okay, and uh, uh, and one more thing that uh, uh, in Europe, uh, the land lease is very expensive. In Ukraine, it's very cheap. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, the, uh, it's possible to make lease of land uh, for construction of such kind of projects, $250 per hectare per annum which means that even with 50, 100 uh, hectares uh, land required for this kind of project, the cost will be only 12 to 25,000 per annum, which is really very expensive. If you compare with uh, uh, similar projects in EU, uh, the price uh, would be uh, higher by more than maybe $1 million uh, lease payments uh, for, this, for this size of the land. And uh, for financing, European Bank of Reconstruction Development, IFU, and uh, European uh, Banks for Developments and Funds, they're, they're financing projects in Ukraine of this kind if the international investor will come. So please, maybe two minutes more, and I, fi I finish with this project, just to give you very quickly the, the key highlights. So currently, the company has uh, uh, ready to build documentation for uh, 33 megawatts. Uh, and, uh, and this project can be divided in three stages. First stage, 33 megawatts, uh, which investor can start building right away. Uh, CapEx about 45 to $50 million. Uh, it's a... Uh, uh, more or less international uh, cost uh, to build uh, one megawatt, it's about 1.3, 1.5 million uh, do dollar. Uh, so, and the, this, this can be financed 30% by equity, it's about $15 million, and loans 70%, it's about $35 million. So, any annual generation electricity, it's about uh, 102. Uh, thousand of megawatts hours 30 80 to 100 US dollars per one megawatt so bda is 7.2 to 10.2 million US dollars in fact the, the payback period of this project can be five to six years which is uh, twice better than in, in than in eu uh, so that is why it's very attractive and, uh, and and uh, the, the good thing about this project that you can sell the electricity in Ukraine and you can build a line and export it and to get uh, better tariffs to Poland. So this, uh, these calculations are made based on Ukrainian tariffs. In case uh, the investor would be able to build a 12 kilometer line, which is possible for Poland, uh, and there are customers there which are ready to to take 10 20 years agreements then this project can become two three times better than basic one for ukrainian uh, uh, needs and uh, okay final slide the investment structure uh, so uh, for investor it's offered to, to buy whether 75 percent of the project, while 35%, the major shareholder will stay as a local partner and he is interested to build uh, and to implement this project. Uh, the major shareholder is the owner, it's Ukrainian uh, entrepreneur, uh, very reputable. He has an engineering company in, in Lviv uh, and uh, has a team of engineers. They have uh, uh, already made projects uh, in uh, wind installations, uh, complex engineering projects. Uh, in case the investor wants uh, and needs such a local partner. In case the investor wants to buy 100%, it's also possible. Uh, so the, uh, the price here uh, is stated that uh, all this documentation of the projects, uh, it's about $100,000 per one megawatt of capacity. 
So which means that with minimum capacity 77, it's 7.7 .7 million dollars to 162 megawatt capacity, it's 14.6 million US dollars. So thank you very much for your intention. Would be glad to get inquiries uh, for, for this project. There are a few slides on uh, showing the location. It's in the mountains. Uh, it's the safest location uh, which can be in Ukraine now and Capacitan Mountains. Uh, before the war, it was due diligences from uh, two international investors. They made all due diligences uh, and on logistics. And uh, if you ask uh, whether it's safe to make this project currently in Ukraine, it's safe because there are two big ongoing wind uh, station construction uh, now in Lviv region. One from very uh, big uh, Ukrainian group and another one from very big international group. And uh, they are getting this Nordex uh, European uh, wind, uh, wind uh, towers already installed in uh, beginning of this year in the mountains. So logistics. Thank you so much for your intention. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, um, Vera and Vitali. Uh, Vera, thank you for, for outlining the tools and, and the work you guys do to build the capacity. Very impactful. Thank you, Vitali, for the presentation. There are a couple of questions in the chat that are specific to the presentation, Vitali. On the um, uh, on the work on the first project you mentioned on the mining, specifically on yes. the royalties that will be paid. So I would encourage you maybe to converse in the chat just for the interest of time at this point right now. There are another three questions that are related more to the general theme that I would probably kindly ask Vera and maybe um, uh, the last presenter for BDO to address that are relevant to more specifics on the cross-border deals, the number of deals, the regions in Ukraine that are currently showing the most potential, uh, and and uh, the question in relation to Prozoro, which is more like a process question, an example of why would the lowest bidder, for example, win and how is the government and the due diligence protected from Chinese bids, as an example here in the question. So if I can kindly ask for the interest of time, all of these questions, so three questions that are related to the macro picture, if we can address them through the BDO representative at the end, and uh, all the project related questions, then we'll go directly to Vitaly to you and you can address them in the chat separately. With okay. this, um, yeah. thank you. Uh, so with this, uh, just in the interest of time, uh, I would like to present uh, the next uh, speaker, Olha Vovk, who is the senior regional manager for uh, Europe at the EDC Canada. Olha, you've been very popular with a lot of questions in the chat already, so I've been navigating as much as I can to push those questions to your end, which I know you will address in your presentation for sure. Um, so Olha will present the, the, the EDC tools and solutions that are designed for the Canadian businesses. You'll hear more about how to manage risk effectively as well as uh, Olya will touch on some of the financing options that are available to support projects in Ukraine and ensuring that the companies can navigate all the complexities of these markets with confidence. So Olga, over to you uh, with your presentation. Thank you so much, Mark, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, um, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you to CUCC for uh, having a DC at uh, this very important webinar. And because, yes, I was look, uh, watching the chat, uh, given the practicality of the um, sort of questions, uh, I will try to be as practical as possible and just um, sort of ensure that if, if I'm to summarize in one sentence, it's Ukraine is open for business and EDC is open in Ukraine. Uh, and with that, I will um, explain what specific uh, requests um, can come to EDC and under uh, what conditions uh, and what Canadian companies uh, can expect and what solutions we offer to support Canadian companies who wish to operate in Ukraine. So maybe if uh, we can move to uh, the uh, slide deck uh, to the next one, um, if it's possible to bring it on screen. Mark, I, I, I able to, to bring the deck yeah, on your end. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm texting yeah. as we speak. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so, so basically uh, I, will, I will start uh, explaining about EDC and um, obviously as many 
countries, as you will expect, they have uh, export credit agencies. So EDC is one uh, of um, uh, of such. So we're Canada's export credit agency, and the idea is essentially to bring financing capacity to uh, countries and to opportunities where private sector may not be able to participate. That being said, it's supporting still bankable risks. Uh, so uh, despite the word development in the name, we're not a development bank, we're the export credit agency of, uh, of Canada. Um, for the size of uh, Canadian economy, uh, EDC is pretty material. Uh, so we uh, provided support to uh, for the total value of uh, basically over 100 billion and um, it, in the year. And with that, we uh, participated, uh, essentially supported shy of 27 um, Southern Canadian companies. And it should be noted that, uh, for example, in terms of financing, uh, we provided over 28 billion in financing, which is obviously uh, quite substantial. Of that, only 9 billion, for example, relates to the uh, clean tech. In terms of um, how we work with the uh, companies, and um, this is very important when it comes to Ukraine. So obviously we operate with a strong emphasis on governance and environmental and social priorities. Uh, if we switch to slide number five, please. Uh, and those are aligned with the UN uh, development goals. So this is obviously uh, the impact in Ukraine is that we will specifically and significantly stretch our credit risk appetite, our structuring appetite, our financing appetite, but we will still complete our environmental governance and human rights due diligence. Uh, and obviously, this means that uh, not all transactions may uh, meet uh, those uh, criteria. So if uh, we move to the next slide, please. Um, so obviously, EDC, we, we don't operate alone and we work with our partners and those uh, include uh, Trade Commissioner Services, BDC, uh, CCC. So it's, it's important to acknowledge that we work with this ecosystem uh, to assess Ukraine in ensuring its ability to access private capital in the years to come. That's on the one side. And on the other side, we're actively and proactively engaging with Canadian exporters and investors across Canada to understand uh, their requirements, what they need so that we can continuously adjust our solutions. Uh, and with that, I want to highlight some points in the next slide uh, that the key points to stress is that we're probably currently the only ECA that continues supporting Ukraine and related businesses on its own balance sheet. So we're not uh, tapping in Canada's national account. To the best of our knowledge, all other ECAs, they're working on the uh, national account or of the national account. At the same time, we provide the full toolkit of our solutions. Um, and this toolkit uh, in, include solutions that relate to war risks. And that these war risks, they're covered across various solutions. And I want to talk in the next slides uh, about those solutions in more detail. So if we um, uh, look at what is available in, in Ukraine and how we can approach it, 
uh, it's essentially when we increase our risk appetite, it's in order to be able to offer products outside of our normal uh, risk kind of uh, sandbox. And those are being offered across financing and insurance. So with these solutions, Canadian companies can access working capital through investment and financing. Uh, we also deliver risk mitigating through a menu of insurance solutions, and those are protecting exporters against non-payment by foreign buyers. Uh, and obviously, we offer an array of trade knowledge and advisory services that will help companies navigate opportunities and make smart decisions. So those will involve also, we would work with companies on how to best structure the deals and which risk uh, mitigation solutions that we have. Well, actually, it may not be one, that can help them ensure that uh, essentially all their risks are mitigated. So if we go into those solutions, each of them in more detail, and hopefully they will address uh, uh, in, in the next slides, please. And the following one. So the first one, and these came up uh, in the chat, is EDC credit insurance and how companies um, basically, specifically in Ukraine, can benefit it. Um, I have to say that to date, the greatest need of Canadian businesses has been to access EDC's credit risk insurance solutions. And probably one of the reasons is that EDC credit risk insurance provides war related risk coverage for exporters. So what this means is um, you may hear credit risk insurance, accounts receivable insurance, trade insurance. So uh, those terms that are used interchangeably. Essentially, if a Canadian company wants to sell something to Ukraine, uh, um, and those companies come to EDC and ask for cover, then the credit insurance against non-payment would cover in case, for example, a missile hits, uh, God forbid, but if this happens, then uh, basically those risks will be covered as well. By having these credit insurance, it's not only that the company has those risks covered, but it also increases for the company uh, increases access to working capital and provides flexibility. And in the next slide, you can see that we have two different options uh, for the credit insurance. One is select credit insurance where you can have, it's a short-term sort of one-off um, uh, coverage that you may need, or you may have, you may apply for portfolio credit insurance, and it covers the uh, ongoing uh, uh, ongoing needs of uh, of the exporters. Probably on credit insurance, um, one thing to highlight is initially we saw huge demand across agri food sector, and when I say initially, it's at the start of the full-scale invasion in 20, uh, 2022 because we remained open uh, from day one, so we never took a pause. Um, gradually, uh, not only did we see increase in demand, but we saw like increase in demand from the company that continued to do business in Ukraine, but also from the company, the, the new ones who um, uh, sort of decided to uh, trade with uh, with Ukraine, and then gradually, um, this demand kind of broadened across other sectors, including light manufacturing, metals and mining, uh, energy sector, um, etc. So it's it's pretty pretty much a growing portfolio. And then, of course, as time goes by, and as the reconstruction needs 
and the need for investment uh, grows, we start getting requests for financing. And that's um, basically where um, our other solutions come into play. So one is the uh, the export uh, guarantee. So EDC can provide guarantees up to 100% to Canadian banks for working capital solutions, which will be extended to Canadian companies who wish to do business in Ukraine. So obviously, if companies want to expand their operations, if they want to invest, they need access to capital. When you go to your banks, whether it's BMR, BC, CABC, TD, or any any other uh, bank that you, you do business with in, in Canada, we can provide up to 100% coverage so that they take on our risk and um, uh, essentially, uh, instead of taking on uh, Ukraine risk or the risk of the company. Uh, so that's uh, uh, that's the benefit to Canadian companies. And then, of course, when you uh, expand business, then Ukrainian counterparties may also require financing solutions. Um, and with that, sort of, this leads me to to the next slide. EDC can essentially offer uh, either direct financing solutions uh, to, and this would be medium long-term financing solutions, or we can provide guarantees to international or Canadian banks who will extend credit lines. Why this is important is because this offers maximum flexibility. So obviously, the question becomes, well, where is the war risk insurance? And we always get it. Um, the thing is, if we act as a direct lender and we extend this medium and long term finance into a Ukrainian counterparty, then we directly take on this risk, whether it's credit risk, whether it's war risk or any other risk. If we provide a guarantee to a uh, international any uh, commercial bank and in case of Ukraine this guarantee is extended to up to a hundred percent again we will take on the risk so by accessing these guarantees or direct finance and solution would offer the risk mitigation because this provides with the finance and where essentially EDC will take on the full risk. In terms of how we approach it, uh, we provide lending in Ukraine most likely at this time on OECD terms, uh, given where the, the market is at. Uh, potential structures may include either bilateral facilities. We work in partnerships with other ECA and banks, so this can be a club or syndicated facility. And then probably if we uh, move to, to the next slide, um, international collaboration. So. International collaboration is extremely important because especially when it comes to uh, financing projects in, in Ukraine, there is a appetite and a desire for not only risk sharing, but also for knowledge sharing. So with that in mind, we convened uh, the G7 regular ECA meetings, and those exactly serve as essentially a platform for ECAs to share knowledge and to come up with the best solutions uh, possible to, to finance uh, projects and share any sort of insights. Uh, we also work with uh, multilaterals, be it EBRD, EAB, uh, we work with DFC, MIGA, and, uh, and others, and we work with commercial banks who either have presence in Ukraine or who are interested in doing business in Ukraine, and then um, devising routes to 
collaborate on how we can provide best possible support and the most efficient uh, sort of financing uh, solutions. And to quickly uh, talk about knowledge, business, and uh, invests, and how we support these. So uh, we developed uh, the and we continue to develop different knowledge uh, solutions and uh, uh, essentially toolkits. Uh, if you can please move to, to the next slide. And these uh, toolkits, uh, they allow Canadian companies to access up-to-date information. So we have the country page, we have a special export help hub, uh, where essentially Canadian companies can uh, can look at different risk mitigating tools and any update. We have a dedicated email address uh, to which Canadian companies can send any questions and um, requests. Uh, and obviously, we continue to working with partners, um, CUCC, TCS in Kiev, Warsaw, and everyone else. Uh, and uh, we will continue to sponsor either the knowledge development tools or conferences. And obviously, we will continue to participate in this uh, to uh, bring solutions to Canadian companies uh, that um, uh, that, that, that the need. So looking forward and moving forward, if we uh, if we we'll look uh, go to the next slide. Uh, essentially, this brings me probably to the beginning of this presentation. The dialogue is ongoing and it's ongoing with the Canadian companies, be it exporters and investors. So they tell us what solutions, what they need, where they potentially may find gaps. And we work on fine tuning their offerings and we, we have so that we offer the full risk mitigating kit to the Canadian companies. Likewise, we work with the Ukrainian companies we're open to working with both private sector and state-owned enterprises uh, across sectors where EDC operates to listen to them and also understand what challenges they face. Um, so as Ukraine remains open for business, EDC will remain not only open in Ukraine, but will remain committed to providing support to Canadian companies who want to do business in Ukraine. Thank you, and uh, I'm happy to address any questions. Thank you, Olga, very much for such a detailed uh, look on uh, overview of the risk management strategy. There is definitely tons of tools available. There is one question in the chat if you if you want to maybe answer this fairly quickly or maybe allow a person to go directly to the, the website or the toolkit itself to address these. But the question is, what are the criteria and conditions for EDC to support a project in Ukraine? And if it's an easy question, feel free to address. And if it's a tougher one, maybe we can just provide the materials after the session for people to learn more about the specific projects. But please comment to what would be the best path for people to learn more about the specific tools for industries and companies. Uh, thank you. I, I will provide a, a, a quick answer, and if uh, sort of if there is a requirement for a more detailed uh, conversation, then I'm happy to take it offline. Uh, so uh, essentially, uh, first criteria for us is that because we're uh, the our mandate is to support Canadian investors or um, uh, or exporters. So. Uh, as I put it, we need to draw a maple leaf and we need uh, to show benefit back to Canada. So we need a Canadian angle to the project. It can be an exporter and investor. So, for example, if it's if the question is from a Canadian company, then Canadian company can come to EDC. And uh, the criteria for for the project is uh, sort of we need to it's it's no different from a project anywhere in any other country so we would need to see a description of the project 
uh, we need to do a minimal due diligence uh, before we uh, sort of do a very quick uh, sort of go no go decision. And this very quick go no go decision is we screen for uh, like where the project is that it's not in sanctioned areas and uh, etc. So um, that's uh, that's obviously. Um, I think important. We also do other ESG uh, screens for um, corruption, financial crimes, etc. So if nothing, uh, at least on the surface, is found, then we can move on to to the next stage, and then we'll work with the company on structuring. And I have to say, there are a number of projects in the pipeline. Uh, it's not a two minute exercise, so it does take time. We're prepared to take time and work with companies to devise those structures. And then we'll go into the due diligence, but then uh, sort of the level, et cetera, will depend on specifics of the project. So I think that's Makes in sense. a nutshell. Um, I will put my direct email in the chat. So if anyone wants to follow up with more detail, then. Thank you so much, Olga, for that. Appreciate that. And I'm sure that we will be following up with the participants so with the material materials that has been shared with more links, tools for you to review sure. at your own time. But I think the, the, the simple answer is that it's case by case. There is no one sort of you know silver bullet that will address all of these. And it's it's a, it's a due diligence that needs to take place before these things can come forward. So thank you for the presentation a lot. Um, we we were supposed to have a coffee break, but unfortunately, due to the very intensive uh, um, content, we will skip that. I encourage everybody to do your own breaks as you see fit. That's probably the only good benefit of the webinars um, that you can control your time and cameras. But we will go straight into the conversation, similar one, but talking about the European partnership. So continue the for for con with the continuing with the agenda. We are pleased to introduce Anna Lebedinitz, who is the associate director of uh, the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development (EBRD). And I will provide an insightful discussion on the financial tools and instruments available through them and that can support your business endeavors in Ukraine. And these tools are designed obviously to help businesses mitigate risk, capitalize on emerging opportunities in Ukraine. And Anna will be the expert to talk about this. So Anna, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for invitation and um, having this uh, opportunity to present uh, um, BRD and what we do in Ukraine. Uh, do you hear me well? Okay, so I will. Oh, share, my end, so assuming yes, yeah. Um, I will share the screen. Uh, so for those who don't know what is a BRD, uh, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development is an international financial institution. Uh, which works in many countries of operations. It is uh, it has AAA rating and works as a country cyclical investor. Uh, it does investments uh, over 10 billion euros each year um, and uh, support the clients uh, again for for development, the con economies for development and in crisis situations such as COVID and the latest uh, war in Ukraine. Um, we have a possibility to do multi-currency, regional, cross-country financial financing facilities. We have access to many local currencies where, in the countries where we operate. Um, loans can be structured uh, across several countries with multiple borrowers um, uh, to mitigate uh, effects risks. Um, tailored loan structures, including long tenors. Um, we can um, provide uh, financing solutions which are needed for the client and for the project. It can be anything from senior debt to equity uh, with various financing structures and with various um, repayment schedules. Uh, we provide um, certain for foreign investors. Uh, we can say that we can provide certain reputational com comfort um, uh, through our shareholding structure with many countries who operate uh, with many foreign current, uh, countries being shareholders and uh, established local market presence. We have local offices in each country of investment and uh, uh, 
maintain relationship with um, key stakeholders and governments in those countries. Um, also, one of the main features, we have a really high focus on sustainability in green, and this is uh, the um, topic which we look for uh, in, in the projects we finance. So this is the map where we are present. Uh, the bank began uh, its um, functioning from the ex-Soviet um, uh, region, but then uh, it's uh, expanded and then continues growing. Um, uh, so this is the numbers about uh, overall uh, investments. Uh, so you see since 1991, we invested over 900, over 190 billion in almost reaching 7,000 projects in various countries. Um, debt, equity, guarantee structure, mostly private uh, investments, but also um, sovereign uh, as well. Um, so now um, about IBRD in Ukraine. Um, we are the largest institutional investor in Ukraine. Uh, since the very beginning, we invested about 20 billion. Um, uh, portfolio now is around uh, 5 billion euros. Uh, we have deep knowledge of the market, strong re relationship with the government and wide network of clients. Uh, we have more than 100 employees uh, which were located in Kyiv, Kharkiv, Lviv and Odessa. Now staff is mostly <clears throat> moved abroad, but uh, still same staff continue to work on the same Ukrainian projects. Uh, we have strong commitment to support Ukraine. We were the first multilateral development bank which took Ukrainian risk on its own balance sheet when the large scale invasion started. And we continue um, our support to date. So here, just as an illustration, we can um, show the um, investments uh, which we did uh, since the war started, uh, just to show you the flavor of uh, what are the areas. So um, the various industries, agribusiness, which was um, obviously needed to address uh, uh, the hurdles uh, agri companies faced. Um, we were financing grain logistics to address the bottleneck. We were financing investments uh, into modernization of production facilities, uh, refinancing because uh, availability of um, you know liquidity for Ukrainian companies became more constrained on the global market. Uh, also, reconstruction of the damaged facilities in in more risky areas. Um, all sorts of liquidity support. Um, there was an um, um, industrial logistic park project uh, in Lviv region, in, uh, equity fund investment, sorry. Uh, a lot of support went to the state, obviously. This is uh, not the usual proportion, um, but due in the war times, a lot of um, financing went to uh, state-owned companies to uh, liquidity support, emergency rehabilitation and repairs. Um, also, we work with municipals and um, other private companies. So this is just to give you a flavor that the BRD works across all the sectors and all the players and uh, has an experience uh, in various areas. Um, um, with this slide, <clears throat> I'm showing the instruments we um, have now actively using in Ukraine for private sector. Uh, so uh, it uh, aims to address needs of various sizes of clients. Uh, obviously, we have direct financing um, bilaterally between the bank and uh, a company. Uh, uh, this is targeted at mid and large corporate clients with a loan size above 10 million. Uh, bilateral financing, if it's a loan um, by BRD under English law, we have obviously uh, doing uh, due diligence uh, on various areas, including environmental and social and legal um, and technical about the project we're financing. There are resharing facilities with um, local commercial banks when we jointly uh, finance one project. Uh, when the Ukrainian bank is a lender under Ukrainian law, but we cover a portion of the risk, and this targets smaller clients with smaller sizes of the loans. 
Uh, and the portfolio resharing facilities um, fully done by, again, Ukrainian commercial banks when we support uh, them with cover on portfolio basis. Uh, we are not looking at each and every loan separately. Uh, the bank makes a portfolio and uh, the sizes are sl um, smaller and it targets uh, SMEs. Um, so what about our priorities uh, in Ukraine uh, going forward for this and years to come? Um, obviously, energy sector, which is um, desperately needing investment now and uh, restoring the uh, capacities uh, which were lost. So we are ready to finance um, um, uh, these projects at uh, conditions um, suitable uh, for the project. This can be renewables, this can be bioenergy, uh, small scale energy generation. Obviously, we're looking for infrastructure, uh, roads and municipalities, but this is also for the state, uh, more for the state support. Uh, we work with financial institutions, um, as I mentioned again, by sharing facilities. And obviously, the corporate sector, industry, commerce and agribusiness will uh, look at food security, food value chain, building materials, um, any green investments, um, including um, green fields. Um, and uh, with um, development of the project, we're also paying a lot of attention currently with um, the topic of human capital recovery. Um, we're developing the projects, helping the companies to address the human resources uh, scarcity and um, can uh, de develop uh, support programs in this area. Uh, this is again slide just a bit more uh, about what types of support we can offer. Um, tailored loan structures, greenfield projects, which we can finance, acquisition, joint venture financing, um, and um, various, uh, covering various uh, needs of um, investor. Um, so as I said in the beginning, EBRD is really dedicated to support Ukraine. Now we're aim to uh, finance uh, during the war times at the current situation, 1.5 billion euros and various sectors per annum. But then after it, the recovery starts, uh, we think that the need uh, will increase even further and um, the financing can reach as high as 3 billion per annum just uh, for one country. So um, these are the contact details. I'm covering agribusiness, but uh, I can lead uh, if needed, uh, the request for other sectors to my colleagues, and I uh, will be happy to have a conversation about uh, prospective projects. That's it on my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation, Anna. I don't believe we have any specific questions, but as I mentioned before, Anyone who is interested in any specific questions to Anna, please either put it here or we'll be able to follow up with a direct contact to Anna directly. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next uh, uh, in our queue, we have uh, Honorable Wayne Easter. He's the president of Razom Investment Canada. And Mr. Mr. Easter will share his inspiring story of starting a business in Ukraine during the wartime and how he tackled the challenges along the road to success. Um, get ready to hear the story of the resilience, determination that sure will leave you motivated. And, and just from my own perspective, we are very happy to to work with uh, Mr. Easter and throughout the conferences and opportunities we created. This is one of those examples that we will keep keep putting uh, as as the success story. So thank you again for your time and, and dedication to Ukraine. Over to you, Mr. Easter. Uh, thank you, Mark, to uh, to try and keep. Uh, OK. Uh, yep. to uh, try and uh, pick up some uh, some time. Go to slide uh, three, uh, and uh, I'll explain uh, Razam uh, in a moment. Back back to, uh, I think you're one ahead of me. Go back one. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, do you have vision and mission there? Anyway, anyway never mind. 
uh, we'll go to, go to uh, we'll we'll start where we're at. Uh, basically, uh, I'll explain Razam in a, in a moment, the company, but our, our vision in the beginning was to become a leading uh, advocate for Ukraine redevelopment uh, and facilitate the transfer of Canadian technology and know-how to Ukraine. But also as we got on the ground in Ukraine, uh, we invited a, a couple of Ukrainians over here to see how we operate, to see how uh, to see uh, manufacturing operations, the industrial sector, the farming sector, farming equipment, because we are involved in farming in Ukraine. Uh, our, our mission, uh, just to keep it simple, uh, is uh, really to build a greater economy between, uh, between both our countries. And uh, the, I, I guess, I think the key point uh, was made by the uh, Prime Minister of Ukraine uh, at the uh, Rebuild uh, Build Back Better uh, conference uh, in Toronto, in which he said, and I want to emphasize this, the economic front is as important as the military front uh, for Ukraine, and you need to be there to invest now. That was in November uh, 2022. Uh, uh, and I would make this point because there's been a number of agencies uh, on here today, and I really believe the the the, the West has been very slow in meeting uh, in a timely fashion uh, its military equipment uh, that Ukrainian military needed to, to defend themselves and to fight back for their territory. Uh, we can't be a laggard on the business side. And I would say to the agencies that are on here, including EDC in Canada, we're not in normal times. Uh, Ukraine's in a war zone. It's not time to leave paper waiting for decision on somebody's desk till you pass it to the next one. The time for decisions and tough decisions uh, is now. So if you turn to uh, the slide about Razam slide, it's either three or four in your list. There we go. Uh, Razama is really a, a Prince Edward Island-based uh, international development company. It has four partners, uh, and uh, the four partners are outlined uh, in the multiple decades of successful international development experience. We have a person who's an expert in potato production, storage, processing, and marketing, and he was involved in Russia, actually, for some uh, 20 years. Uh, we've got a, a veterinarian who has uh, a strong on dairy and beef genetics production and uh, processing in that sector. Uh, and I would say one thing that actually surprised me on the ground in Ukraine is the size of their... Apologies for the disruption. We'll give um, um, Mr. Um, Easter a couple of more seconds to reconnect. Uh, just in terms of the agenda and the next steps to manage time accordingly, as I see... Um, uh, we are a bit over time. We after after um, uh, Wayne Easter presentation, we still have two more presentations to go over, which will be a wrap up for the day. And the next presentation after Razom will be with with uh, Viktor uh, Namarzhetsky, who is the text partner at the BDO in Ukraine. We're going to be talking about doing business in Ukraine. We're going to be talking about local advisory, etc. And then we're going to be wrapping up with uh, our first speaker. Um, on some of the guides for Ukraine when it comes to more practical um, ways of uh, um, business development, so tips on the safe trial of insurance, etc. So let's give maybe another 30 seconds for Wayne Easter to come back, and if not, we'll just skip through and go straight to Viktor, if that's okay, with the organizers as well. Okay, those things happen. I, I guess just in the interest of time, I think it would be best to to pass it over to Andre and Victor, and uh, if need be, we will come back to Wayne when he's back at the office. So, guys, over to you. Um, talking about, uh, I already mentioned what, so please take the mic. The floor. Okay. Is Th thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I'm just like make a, a quick introduction on this part of presentation, and uh, then uh, I pass microphone to Victor. So uh, please uh, start the presentation, the first slide. So like uh, you see, uh, our part is about doing business uh, in Ukraine in many ways. Uh, and uh, our role as a local partner is probably not only ours, but 
like local partner, its importance and uh, a potential uh, effect uh, uh, on your business. So uh, since February uh, and start of this uh, part of uh, Ukrainian Russian war, uh, over 2,600 companies have been established by uh, foreigners uh, from uh, 100 countries. So lots of people uh, investing here is probably just just establishing. Uh, but uh, we know lots of companies who really uh, invest um, uh, in our country or interested in that. Uh, it's just a very, very short slide. The most rapidly growing industries in Ukraine. This, Many of them we already discussed during this uh, presentation. That's for sure Meditech, uh, lots of Ukrainian startups, uh, some well known, some very silent, but we know uh, something about the, uh, them and probably can help here. Uh, construction and real estate, but not only construction itself. We, uh, you remember that it's uh, nominally more than 150 uh, uh, billion in uh, destroyed. Uh, property and uh, up to like uh, half a trillion uh, in uh, potential recovery needs. Uh, so lots of things here, but also construction materials. So like natural resources, uh, you should understand that it's not only uh, exporting things like titanium, for example, but also uh, things which can support construction. And we have lots of requests on, for example, deal advisory in, in this in this area. Energy, definitely, including renewables. Uh, this uh, decentralization of our energy system is a key. Uh, agriculture is usual. Uh, as I said before, uh, we already on pre-war, almost pre-war level of uh, agri-expert. So uh, despite uh, mines, uh, despite uh, all the uh, shellings, uh, our uh, people from agriculture are doing their job. And also we are in the middle of uh, land uh, reform, uh, which uh, already allowed uh, legal entities, but unfortunately not uh, foreign one, to purchase Ukrainian land. But we believe that it's intermediate step for the further liberalization. IT, as usual, uh, our IT guys they are working from everywhere. We have number of. Uh, very successful product companies in IT, but also Ukraine is well known uh, with uh, its outsourcing. And uh, I believe that it's very, very good uh, thing in terms of taxes. And Victor, tell about that. And logistics, um, as usual, uh, because now it's really transforming because uh, Ukraine probably won't be uh, in the center between like Russia and Europe, uh, because I believe that Russian border would be closed for for many many years. Uh, but logistics uh, is still actual. For example, river logistics to Romania, Romania, uh, that's lots of uh, logistics connected uh, with uh, trains, uh, with cars, and and so on. So it's. Um, very important uh, here. So it's not everything, but at the matter of time, just just be focused on these areas. Uh, and we believe that probably we need like to make some additional discussion on exact companies, exact industries. Uh, but uh, let's let's let, let's start with this. Uh, please next slide, and I would like uh, to ask Victor to join here because it's like Texas, which is very very important in doing business here. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, Ukrainian tax system is uh, quite quite simple, let me say, comparing to uh, Western European, US or Canadian systems. Tax rates, uh, corporate tax rate is uh, also not high. Personal taxes are times lower than uh, in other countries. From that perspective, Ukraine is uh, very preferential. Uh, for doing business, for paying contractors and so on. Interesting point about the free trade agreement, which was um, which came into effect recently, like two months ago, <clears throat> and uh, it uh, effectively removes uh, uh, import duty, uh, which is normally up to 10% for most of imports from Canada, and uh, therefore removes like uh, most uh, obstacle in that respect. Uh, despite this uh, simplicity of Ukrainian tax system, <clears throat> in addition to that, uh, Ukraine proposed a few uh, tax preferential regimes. Uh, next slide, please. Which are uh, one of the prospering IT system in Ukraine and for prospering agricultural business in Ukraine. 
And the first uh, special tax regime is a so-called uh, turnover tax for private entrepreneurs. And as, a, as an effect, uh, absolute majority of Ukrainian IT professionals are engaged uh, as private entrepreneurs, uh, either on local contracts or from abroad, and they just paid 5% tax on that. And uh, you can compare it to like 20, 30, 40% uh, tax rates in other countries. And uh, it's not uh, surprising that uh, Ukrainian IT uh, sector is booming as a result. For the for the last uh, ten years at least, and uh, for example, Grammarly, all of us uh, all of us know Grammarly. It is uh, from Ukraine, and the uh, absolute majority of their team is sitting in Ukraine. As an example of uh, business uh, that developed uh, mostly thanks to this tax uh, exemption, because uh, clients come for for that tax exemption, and the business is developed. Next tax privilege is for agricultural businesses uh, that uh, have uh, that can pay only very low tax instead of um, uh, regular 15% uh, corporate income tax. And again, it's uh, very interesting and very tax efficient. And uh, therefore, it's uh, another reason for agricultural businesses in Ukraine prospering. Next slide, please. <laughs> And uh, the gem of Ukrainian tax system is a uh, so-called DSCT tax and legal regime for IT businesses, which is uh, the next step for uh, stimulating developing uh, IT businesses in Ukraine. Uh, in short terms, it uh, provides uh, this 5% taxation to their teams, uh, very low social security contributions, just $44 per month approximately. And uh, on top of that, it uh, proposes election for 9% exit, exit capital tax instead of regular income tax. Also, um, in addition to these tax exemptions, uh, such a regime provides for possibility to use uh, some common law uh, rules in Ukraine, in Ukrainian contracts, for example, um, uh, non-compete, uh, confidentiality, and so on and so on. As a result, uh, like more than 1,000 IT companies joined this regime and are happy residents of the city. And uh, it is believed that uh, this regime, which is existing for two years, uh, is uh, giving another boost for Ukrainian IT sector. And uh, it is also available for startups, as it is shown on the right side of the um, of my slide. And uh, generally, that's all about Ukrainian tax system in uh, very short slides. And uh, if any questions, please uh, let me know. Uh, we are advising on that. We have many Ukrainian IT companies uh, among our accounting advisory and. Uh, uh, services uh, clients, and um, we would be happy to assist in that. Okay, thank yes. you, Victor. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you very much. So we uh, we are like moving forward. We understand that we are, like out of time. So please, uh, then next slide. Um, ah, uh, okay, Victor, uh, it's your part as well, so you can finish here. I uh, just forgot about this slide. Here is uh, the comparative slide for uh, for the last uh, uh, comparing tax costs for IT businesses uh, based on these assumptions in different countries. It's uh, Ukraine, DCT, India, Kazakhstan, US, Delaware, Georgia, Poland, and so on. And uh, as you can see, Ukraine is like times lower to uh, too many popular jurisdictions uh, slightly lower than for example india which is uh, believed the cheapest one therefore it's uh, another like um, example uh, another calculation how beneficial is, is this regime from the tax perspective and this is all great great so i think that it's very a helpful table. So uh, now we are moving to role of BDO and uh, uh, Canadian Ukraine uh, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, please uh, come to the next slide. Uh, 
Uh, so it's a bit about us. So BDO is a, a large global network. Uh, we are 14 billion in revenues and growing fast, like plus 10% for the last year. It's about uh, 13 uh, billion euro. Uh, uh, more than half in Americas, uh, like third in EMEA and uh, uh, rest in Asia Pacific. Uh, we still have lots uh, in audit, more than 40%, but advisory, this my service line uh, is growing. Now it's 21%. It's probably not that large, but uh, really comparing to like five years uh, ago, that's a very uh, good growth. Uh, taxes from Victor, uh, 23, and uh, business uh, services and outsourcing, it's also Victor, I need to say, so he can he can help in BISA as well. So uh, more than uh, 115,000 people uh, and uh, more than 1,700, almost 100, uh, 800, uh, of, well, 1,800 offices in uh, 166 countries and territories. Uh, please, next slide. So, like, it's our cooperation. It's video global network and Canada Ukraine uh, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we uh, can provide comprehensive support for Canadian businesses. It's all about this meeting. So, please, next slide. Uh, that's uh, a bit uh, about our rules, uh, our services, which can be uh, helpful for uh, any, any business who who's entering the uh entering our country so, so first of all it's market entry and research, uh, and research because uh, we we do understand that uh um, it's it's very necessary to to get uh, proper local support in this area and i'm happy to say that uh, i started my career as uh, like analyst in research and uh, there was a period when research was not that important, but now it's it's uh, returning. Lots of people coming to Ukraine would like to understand the exact industry or our country as a whole. So we are hiring a lot and we are uh, teaching uh, new analysts. And I believe that uh, we would be able to support you. Regulatory and compliance support quite understandable uh, and Victor said that we have some things quite easy for example uh, in, in terms of general taxation system but there are always details uh, and our lawyers can help here. Financial and tax advisory uh, that's uh, what Victor all about it's um, taxation and financial regulation but also our accounting advisory can help with accounting and now the auditors can help with auditing services. M&A transaction support, uh, but I would rather say deal advisory because it's not only about M&A, it's uh, about due diligence, about valuation. We can find proper target, we can evaluate it, uh, and uh, uh, definitely we know what's going on on our market. Uh, please, next slide. Uh, supporting participation in tenders. That's a relatively new uh, business line because uh, at the moment we see lots of opportunities uh, and uh, you or your clients uh, could be interested in participation. Uh, for example, some large uh, Ukrainian uh, state-owned company uh, can um, like produce a new tender for equipment for some services and sometimes it's quite difficult to participate uh, because like some local regulations some documentation and we can uh, help as well so you can just come to us and uh, with, with something you're interested in or uh, we can help with finding something interesting for you or your clients risk management understandable uh, very good function for a local partner uh, networking and connection. Definitely, we can uh, can be useful in uh, finding some contacts, uh, helping you uh, either on business or public level, because we do have lots of connections uh, here, working with all the ministries, lots of large companies as an auditor, as a consultant, and so on. And uh, definitely, uh, my uh, favorite uh, an analytics on culture and business practice insights. So that could be either report or that could be investigation for you in um, uh, some uh, practice, some business culture. So ask us any questions, we would be uh, here to help. Uh, I think that it's not like everything to be covered. We have uh, much uh, more services, uh, for example, uh, 
uh, we we can help for existing business, uh, not only in establishing, but for example, in automation, uh, in uh, some uh, the policies, in supporting and providing some operational support. So that's lots of things. Uh, you can find my contacts, Victor's contacts, and everyone in video in Ukraine, uh, and uh, we definitely can 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 help. Vitaly Strukov also presented. So deal advisor is. Uh, M and A part is full. Um, uh, his uh, his part. So uh, looking forward to hearing from you, all your requests, uh, and uh, we here to help. So this is like this part, uh, and uh, we have the next one also mine. So I would rather make very short introduction to that. That. Um, we uh, decided to finish this part with um, our guide. That's a guide uh, for uh, any potential investor or any uh, colleague abroad uh, who would like to visit Ukraine. But uh, I started like with answering question, uh, how are you? And I would like to finish with uh, uh, the answer to question, how can we get you, how we can get Ukraine? So uh, sometimes we have like two absolutely different positions. One of them, is it uh, like safe to fly to Kiev? So that means that the uh, person who asked that uh, do not understand current reality. It's, it's fine. We, we are here to help as well. Uh, but well, you know, I think that all of you know that it's no flights, unfortunately. Um, or that could be absolutely different and very strong questions. For example, is it safe to come um, uh, to Kiev, for example? Uh, so uh, are there lots of military posts uh, who can like stop me? Uh, and uh, do people like foreigners, for example? Probably they are too cautious. Uh, can we call someone and establish a meeting or it's uh, very uh, dangerous uh, and, and questions like that. So it's absolutely fine. We understand that people sometimes uh, do not uh, see the reality and we would like to uh, concentrate on a practical guide, how to uh, get, how to live uh, here uh, and uh, everything necessary for your safety. Uh, I would like to ask my colleagues to put uh, a link for, for the full guide, but here it's like a short summary here. So first of all, uh, as, as I said, it's uh, our guide. So you see it's uh, through uh, Biden uh, and uh, train. So everything uh, you, you will see in case you're, you're going to Ukraine. So if Biden managed, you, you will manage as well. It's absolutely sure. So first of all, uh, Iranian border. Uh, the good news that uh, major part uh, of um, um, Western citizens uh, would be able to visit Ukraine without visas, but uh, definitely need to check. So usually it's a valid passport. Uh, it's uh, uh, entry visa if required. You need to check that. But I think, for example, European Union and I think Canada, United States, they do not need visa, but let's check that. A residence permit, uh, but uh, again, that's more about who gets this permit before. And health insurance policy. So for major part, that would be passport and uh, health insurance policy, but I think you will definitely uh, buy that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so no flights, as I already announced, uh, but uh, it's uh, trains, buses, and cars. Uh, about buses and cars, uh, I would say that sometimes that could be fast, sometimes it could be slow, because uh, in, in this case you will, uh, you, you will uh, stay in queues on, on borders and trains from all uh, countries uh, across Ukraine. So, uh, for example, not a bad idea to come to, for example, Warsaw in Poland. We have direct train, but it's uh, like I think it's one of them only, but uh, more from from the border, from Helm and Przemysl. So lots uh, of different train from uh, like Hungary, from uh, Slovakia. So it's 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 always uh, a, a good idea to to find. A uh, good point for you to fly and then to take a uh, train from here. 
uh, lots of border crossing points. You see the uh, right map uh, in case you are moving with bus or with car. Uh, it's absolutely manageable. Did it many times. So next uh, slide, please. Uh, okay, so uh, that uh, could be some special uh, recommendation in case you are moving with a, a car and uh, in case you are a checkpoint and blog post, a uh, number of them inside Ukraine still, especially uh, when you're coming to large cities. So I think in case you are moving from Polish border, for example, to Kiev, uh, you will find at least several of large blog posts. So uh, definitely nothing dangerous here. Uh, the only recommendation just not to be provocative, uh, like provide documents, uh, reduce the speed, pre uh, turn on headlights, not to take photos, videos, and everything would be fine. So just 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 uh, just take in mind that uh, sometimes you you can find uh, things like that even inside large cities. So sometimes you can find a blog post or a checkpoint at at some point, but it's not like each step. But uh, a number of them uh, exist in Kiev, and not every car would be like stopped. Uh, but if you are lucky, so like just provide your documents, it will be fine. Next slide, please. Yeah, so when to purchase train tickets? Ukrzaliznice, our national train operator, they have good iOS and Android applications. PKP Intercity, PKP Intercity is Polish one. Also, some tickets can be purchased here, and some of them should be combined because sometimes you are coming to Warsaw and need to come to at first with Intercity to Helm, and from Helm. Uh, you can uh, take a uh, train to Kiev, for example, and Colio, the uh, Universal Train Journey Planner. So that would be helpful to, to have all of them, especially if you're moving uh, through Poland. Accommodation, uh, lots of hotels uh, in, in each uh, more or less large city in Ukraine, but uh, we made a special list for you with um, uh, in-house shelters uh, or uh, which is close to shelters. So like, advice it, it would be uh, more convenient for you to take um, a hotel with uh, shelters so you just can can come down in case of um, air strike alarm uh, so that's uh, more or less relevant for all the cities but we still do not recommend to come uh, to Odessa and Kharkiv uh, despite uh, well uh, they more or less fine, but but still it's much more dangerous, especially Kharkiv at the moment. So just just understand what you're doing if you're if you're going there. So uh, map of shelters, uh, it, it's it's not like map of shelters. It's a map of uh, this careful map. Uh, so I mean uh, all the hours when you can't come to uh, to the street. Uh, it's not like you you will be killed uh, on the place, but you can be fined, and uh, you definitely uh, would be in attention of uh, soldiers and police. So it's just quite not recommended to be uh, on the uh, streets during these hours. Uh, like on my opinion, for me, it's absolutely not a problem because I have like three small kids uh, and. Uh, all the time I, I, I'm sleeping, so I, I do not know the current schedule. This is never be on the street uh, during these night hours. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so city transportation, more or less uh, the same as, uh, as usual. It's public transport, buses and uh, metro. Uh, in uh, Kiev and Kharkiv, uh, the pro metro is working as a shelter as well. So you can come to subway in case uh, there is uh, air alarm and usually it's uh, free of uh, charge to, to come to subway uh, during the uh, alarms. Uh, and uh, that could be some specialties. Uh, for example, in Kiev, we have a part of subway is uh, not underground, but it's uh, on the ground. And this part, which is underground, is halted during um, uh, uh, air strike alarms. So that could be uh, sometimes not a good idea to take metro. And well, that in, in this case, you, you can take a taxi. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so insurance, a uh, number of uh, companies providing insurance in Ukraine, Zul, Aranta, it's our national one, uh, Innovative Insurance Capital, Ridna, that's all Ukrainian companies. 
Uh, I think it's not a bad idea to take insurance from Ukrainian company because it could be like many times uh, less than uh, foreign uh, companies who can like uh, uh, leverage uh, potential dangers. So that's a uh, very small amount of money. Like that could be uh, something like two, three, five euro per day. And uh, you can can have uh, nice uh, coverage comparing to other touristic one. Uh, yeah, useful resources. It's uh, our applications, Kiev Digital. Uh, that's for Kiev residents, but uh, could be useful for you as well because lots of things digitalized in Kiev. Uh, you can uh, buy tickets uh, for any transport. You can park here and find parking floats. Uh, you can get uh, signals on fire alarm before you can uh, uh, hear the, them uh, on, um, on the street. So lots of services, so, so almost everything in Kiev can be found in Kiev Digital. Air Alarm, that's uh, the application by Ajax Systems, one of very well-known Ukrainian product company, security systems. Uh, good one, uh, have a map, uh, on uh, air, air alarm, you can you can like even find out uh, what is the reason for that, where the air alarm is uh, already sounding. So just specialized software for that. And Flixbox, uh, Flixbox, uh, probably you know the services. Uh, they work in Ukraine uh, and uh, provide lots of roads uh, on buses uh, across Ukraine and also abroad. Next, yeah, and like last but the, not the least, it's our guide itself. Uh, asked to provide it and you can find it in the chat, uh, but also that's a link uh, in the uh, presentation. So that's uh, last slide of this presentation and it's formal invitation to like all of you uh, who is not in Ukraine at the moment. Uh, we looking forward to see you here. Thank you colleagues. That's, that's it from my side. Andriy, thank you very much. A very informative session, uh, very interesting material and content, very useful and practical, so appreciate that. With this, we are having back um, Honorable Wayne Easter to wrap up today's day with very exciting conversation about his journey and how his this he can validate the practicality of everything that has been said. So even though we had some technical difficulties, we we're happy to welcome back uh, Wayne Easter with his um, with his continuation of his uh, speech. And over to you, Mr. Easter. And uh, with this, I also would Hello, like to thanks. apologize, but I'll, my colleagues will be taking over, so I'll be off camera. And I would like to wish everybody a great day. Thank you so much, yeah. Wayne. Over to you. Uh, all right. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, we got a connection to Kiev, obviously. The lights went out here <clears throat> in PEI, what happened? So, <laughs> and our generators obviously don't kick in as quick. Uh, I can vouch for everything the last speaker said on uh, on trains uh, getting into. Uh, we've been, I've been there, I think, five times, My par four times my partner's been there, uh, five and another partner's been there once. Uh, it's not a pleasant train ride from Warsaw, but everything uh, works well and the connections are made. Turn to uh, to uh, slide uh, four again, and we'll start there in order to save time. I had, uh, uh, it, uh, if somebody could go through there, next one. No, uh, uh, no, uh, they must be mixed up on your end. Can you back up a little? We'll see if we can come to about Razam. There, hope oh, one ahead now. There, uh, I was mentioning that uh, we, uh, uh, our partners had uh, expertise in potatoes, uh, uh, dairy and beef genetics, uh, also aquaculture genetics uh, in production. And there's a real opportunity in Ukraine uh, for aquaculture, shellfish farming. Uh, but there is a problem. Uh, the estuaries are all within the national park. Uh, system uh, and they don't allow uh, production there. So to to get to any economic production on those estuaries, there had to be a policy change on the part of the government. I had mentioned earlier about a huge dairy industry. We really believe that there's an opportunity for a lot of beef production. You could breed the bottom one third of the dairy industry to beef uh, and establish a strong uh, beef industry in Ukraine. Uh, there's lots of land base for the hay and the and the uh, uh, utilizing in the manure and cash crop production and so on. 
Uh, one of her partners has considerable experience in uh, commodity trading and the aerospace development, and that's important uh, for doing uh, business uh, in, a, in a global sense. Uh, we're currently partnering with the Canadian Ukrainian uh, uh, folks in agriculture production, and I would be brutally honest to say that we wouldn't be where we are and, uh, and on the ground in Ukraine if it wasn't for an individual we met uh, at the uh, CUCC uh, conference in 2022, uh, an individual from Manitoba who has uh, partnered uh, with uh, two firms in Ukraine, and that's how we're really on the ground there. We had a uh, crop in last year. We had a very successful potato production, as good as the best production on PEI, and uh, we didn't use uh, irrigation. Uh, we have a crop on the ground. My colleague just got back uh, Sunday, uh, and uh, the crop is in the ground this year, and we're going to use irrigation and some of that just to compare uh, what it'll do in terms of production. Uh, handling and storage is key. Uh, and this was one of the areas we ran into considerable difficulty last year, uh, finding a good storage because we didn't have the capital to build one. Uh, finding a good storage, uh, a lot of trucking involved. Uh, but eventually we get the job done uh, at considerable cost. Uh, and uh, so storage, shipping, grading, and sales were done with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, partners uh, in Ukraine. This year, looking ahead, we have to find the capital to put up a proper, uh, a proper storage and ventilation and handling system. Uh, turning to the next slide, next slide, uh, short-term goals. Uh, keep going. Next one. Hello, there, there. Short-term goals, we would like to uh, prove a potato seed production model in Ukraine uh, that works. Uh, we would, uh, we are actually in a lot of discussions and we've did a fair bit of business with the uh, president of the UK, Ukraine uh, Potato Association, who's also into manufacturing potato equipment. Uh, and we would like to, uh, we're working towards uh, setting up a, a potato campus uh, in which the uh, certification, you need a regulatory system, but the certification of quality seed uh, would be possible. Uh, it'd take about three or four years to establish, but it would make uh, huge gains uh, in the uh, Ukraine uh, potato industry. Uh, we're looking at uh, securing the rights to a high yielding uh, potato seed uh, variety that we've used. Uh, and we continue to formalize uh, relationships with local partners and suppliers. There is nothing like being on the ground, absolutely nothing like being on the ground in Ukraine uh, to meet the people, to build relationships, uh, and to see the, uh, see the opportunities that are there. Those slides are of the uh, potatoes in blossom, uh, doing the harvest, and the uh, potato storage, which was in the Brovery area. Next slide. Uh, the medium uh, long-term goals that uh, we have would be to expand, expand uh, seed uh, potato production in Ukraine, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, establishing a potato campus uh, and the regulatory and certification environment to uh, assure the uh, folks that you had uh, good seed. Uh, we would uh, we already are increasing fresh potato production and processing. There's opportunities for uh, small uh, potato processing facilities, uh, and we are working with a Canadian company actually on one such venture there. Uh, I'd mentioned we'd like to introduce the Canadian beef uh, genetics, husbandry, and processing models into into Ukraine. Beef isn't a uh, uh, certainly isn't big in consumer demand, uh, but I think that could be uh, built. I mentioned the agriculture production, firm uh, level uh, green energy production, and our vision really would be to have a Canadian center of excellence advocating uh, best practices in the agriculture uh, sector. Uh, and that would require uh, uh, support uh, from the government of Canada to do that, but that just makes so much sense. Uh, next slide, which is pretty near the last one. Um, 
uh, in uh, before I conclude, I, I would mention a couple of, uh, because there's a number of players on that have been uh, talking about uh, what they can do in the industry. Obtaining capital is a problem. There's no question about that. Uh, without, especially I think in the agriculture sector, because uh, without ownership of the asset, asset it's difficult uh, to uh, protect uh the the comp company financially uh and foreigners can't own the, own land uh in the agriculture sector in ukraine uh i agree with that policy actually i think it'd be a mistake for uh, ukraine to allow foreign ownership uh, but it it becomes a problem in acquiring capital i would say to people to be wary of the vat uh, when uh, vat we went there, we thought it uh, operated the same as the GST in Canada, HST in Canada, and it doesn't. Uh, similarities, but it's not all the same, so check that out. The paperwork required in importing equipment is uh, pretty horrendous. Uh, so you should be uh, aware of that and uh, uh, difficulty of getting equipment across in a timely fashion across the, the borders. Uh, but I do believe uh, Canada has a significant role uh, to play given it's our large Ukrainian diaspora. Uh, Razam, our company, is on the ground and we're tangibly uh, demonstrating our commitment to the Rebuild Ukraine effort. And that is appreciated on the ground. When I, my partner went over this year, uh, the, one of the guys in the farm said, oh, we're here to plant potatoes again. Great. Uh, and they like to see that. Uh, it gives people joy in the area to see uh, proper production, proper production methods, uh, and economy coming in. Uh, we've, as I said, had uh, terrific results so far on the seed uh, potato production, three times uh, the yield uh, that Ukrainians were getting in this particular area using our methods. Uh, and uh, uh, we need to uh, seek support from uh, from many partners to realize uh, our vision for uh, Ukrainian uh, development. The slide at the bottom is uh, presenting a PEI flag to the mayor, uh, mayor of Slavutich. Uh, and that is an area that there's real opportunities in. A lot of industrial buildings uh, sit empty, uh, good farmland in the area. And we're partnering with the guy in the, in that area on uh, uh, on potato production. Uh, he also manufactures uh, potato equipment. So I think the the opportunities uh, are really uh, endless. But you need to be there uh, to make the, those connections, and it's appreciated uh, by MPs we've met, by people on the ground that you're actually on the ground here. You're not just talking about us, but you're on the ground. Uh, doing tangible work uh, and increasing their economy. And I go to the, one, the last slide for one last thought. This is a picture, uh, I think, partly for people that haven't been to Ukraine. Um, they watch TV, they see the war, they hear about the missiles. This is a picture of downtown Kiev. Uh, and if you're on the street in Kiev, you'd think you're in downtown Toronto. A air alert may have just went off uh, not long ago before that or shortly after. But life goes on. You're in a grocery store and the lights go out. People don't bat an eye because life goes on. We have to be there to support these people, not only militarily, uh, but uh, on the business side, uh, and I just don't think we're there to the extent we uh, we, we should be. Uh, I have a second picture that's not here. But looking at my hotel, when I spoke to a couple of women's institutes here over the last few uh, weeks, and one of our partners has as well, uh, and it's a slide looking out the hotel window, and you see three big building cranes. That's in Kiev. They're not rebuilding what was damaged by a missile. They're building new buildings. So it shows the economy continues 
to go on. So I'll conclude with the point the Prime Minister meant as spoke when he spoke in 2022. The economic front is as important as the military front, and we need Canadians there now to invest. So with that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much and all the best. Wayne, thank you very much. That was the best closing I've have, I've I've have heard in a long time. And you're not even Ukrainian diaspora in thank Canada. You you're much. Canadian, Canadian as they come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Easter. It was really inspiring. It was a great last presentation. Um, and that concludes our webinar today. Thank you so much for everyone for joining us today. And uh, we hope to see you at our next events, especially the Rebuild Ukraine conference in December. And thank you very much to BDO team for organization of this event. Thank you. Thank you.